Hey, welcome to episode 166 of the Collector's Quest podcast. In this episode, we're going to be broadly generalizing the price of games when a console was current compared to inflation. So if you had bought every single game for a particular console and just kept them complete in box or even card only, and you looked at the prices of those games now, how many of those games are worth more than you paid for them after factoring in the cost of inflation? It's a kind of strange metric, but I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about this, so we're going to be talking about it for like two hours on the show today. Other than that, tell your mom about the show, give us five stars on iTunes, join our Patreon, and let's go. Welcome back to another episode of Collector's Quest. I'm Tyler here with Johnny and Stefan. What's going on, guys? Before we do anything, I got a text from Kate saying, please mention me on your podcast. And since I know that there's no way in hell that my girlfriend will listen to the entire podcast, <laughs> I'm going to get that net out of the way now. Nope. Tyler, Hello, don't let Kate. it happen. Edit it. Hello, nope. Kate. Hey, Kate, I tell lo- your mom about the show. My mom listens to the show so they can be friends and, and talk about the video game market? I don't know. <laughs> I, what, are you suggesting that Kate is like Stefan's mom? Well, I'm asking Kate to ask her mom to <laughs> no, there's, listen to I, the I, show. I definitely have not uh, fallen into the trope of like dating someone who is like your mother. Kate and my mother have absolutely nothing in common. No, I, I mean, they're kind of similar in the way that you tried to have sex with Tyler's mom, and now you do have oh, sex with Kate. Oh, we're talking about Tyler's mom. Then yes, yeah. yes, they, yeah. they do have, they are very similar. Then yes. Hey, welcome back to another episode <laughs> of Collector's Quest. Where you too can take uh, shots at Tyler's mom. I was assuming mom. that happened at my wedding, but you know, what happens at that train station stays at that train look, station. Look, look, I'm just saying I really enjoyed dancing with your mother, and I don't I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. It's It's been well established on this show. Everybody loves my mom. That's right. Yeah. And that she listens to the show. Yes. Yep. Also well established. So now, now I feel worse about my joke, because your mom does listen to the show. Uh, but <laughs> Stefan was Way a little to be bit awkward, inappropriate. Johnny. I mean, if I am awkward, I, mean, I learned it from really, you. Really, I, I don't think it's anyone here's decision as to whether or not I was inappropriate towards your mother. I think she can make the decision. You know what I'm saying? Guys, the Queen's Weenus <laughs> Wee is for sale. <laughs> the Queen's Did you weenus. say the Queen's Weenus? <laughs> Queen's Weenus. <laughs> said the... um, all right, wait, let's update everyone first. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about Queen Elizabeth II, who is somehow still alive. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, Johnny, what's as that? of what's this as of this recording? You, you gotta say that just in case. <laughs> as of this recording, <laughs> I'm looking at Wikipedia. They haven't changed the is to a was yet. Uh, Stefan, you have the most firsthand experience with this silly topic we're about to discuss. Can you tell me what is going on? Well, yeah, first, I-, I would like hold on before you go further. I just want to know. How much time does she have, Stefan? Do you, have you already started trying to get an autograph? Uh, Queen Elizabeth II? Is that yeah. a thing? Does she sign stuff? I don't know. I'm I can't asked, imagine she does. Like, if anybody's going to know, it's going to be you. I'm just saying, if you have an autograph, then that means that's a like a real big ticking clock above her head. That's like short. <laughs> that would be very strange I mean, well, to have the Queen autographing no, what, I, what that really means is that she's now allowed to go. Like, that's, you know, it's okay now. Oh, it's approval, I, mean, like, I see. That was like, yeah, that was like when I got Alex Trebek's autograph. It was like, okay, Alex, you can go now. Be at peace. <laughs> what? That's <laughs> this death is, on this, this show, is guys. Weird. Yeah, that was, all, <laughs> that was pretty weird. Hey, you know what? According to our listeners, they really, really liked the last episode. I, so, yeah. Some of our listeners, we didn't hear from all of our listeners. We didn't even do a survey. That would be really bad data to just to try and validate and say, you know what? All of our listeners love this. That, well, we Johnny, it's a good thing we're not talking about bad data on this show, right? Oh, no, we are. We <laughs> absolutely 100% are talking about bad data. <sighs> oh, good stuff. I'll breathe, good, breathe, good stuff. breathe, 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 uh, breathe. Oh, All right. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, Queen's Wee. So uh, the short, short version, um, there was a Wii that was ma- that was not manufactured. It was, go- it was electroplated by THQ. Uh, when they were, is it Family Games? Is that the name of the Wii game there, Tyler? Big Family uh, Games. Yeah, Big Family Games. Um, so it was sort of one of in, in the death throes of THQ. As a publicity stunt, 
They they electroplated this gold Wii and sent it to Buckingham Palace. And now, uh, after the yeah, okay, so, hold on, well, I, I so, want to keep this as factual as possible. Is there evidence they actually got to the point where they could send it to Buckingham Palace? They don't know because it's not fully authenticated. Like it but, is like, supposed. Legit, all you need, though, is the address to Buckingham Palace, and you can send things there. They will not accept them, which is where, where the interesting, the the kind of bleh, comes into the story here, is that uh, it was, it was quote-unquote, made for the Queen as a publicity stunt, then sent to Buckingham Palace, where it was promptly rejected because you can't f***ing send shit to Queen Elizabeth! Um, and then it was then returned to THQ, uh, the the uh, assumption then now is that during the sort of liquidation of the company as they went under, uh, a, a collector then purchased that Wii, um, which is allegedly the one that is now on eBay for 300,000 X dollars. So it's not really the Queen's Wii. Yeah. Intended. There's a big difference between intended for someone and owned by someone. Yes. And you can uh, look at all of your sources, all the different articles about this is like everywhere. I can't believe like how much news has picked up this stupid thing. Also, by the time you're listening to this, uh, this news, was like news doesn't like data or facts. They don't check anything. But, but good news, like reporters pick. are supposed to, but like the reporters blogosphere where they garbage. just copy someone else's blog article and make it their own is just like no, they they don't and, check anymore. It, it's it's instant headlines. If you're not printing the headline immediately, you've already lost. No one's got time for facts. Well, that was the, the way it was. Get out of here, Tyler. That was the way it was at the time too, right? All of the game news media picked this up and was like, "Oh my God, THQ made a made a." F- in console for Queen Elizabeth, and now she's playing Wii Sports on that. Sh-. Like there was just like there was a lot of media buzz around this, and and yet not about the fact that like nobody bothered to follow up like as to whether or not it ever made it. So there so are there was no, just- there are some good articles. Uh, I think the Yahoo article is Golden Nintendo Wii created for Queen Elizabeth II now on sale, and then it even nice. goes into like no, no, no. I'm talking, I'm talking about like the the, the, the articles that were generated at the time, Wh- which is what THQ expected oh, and knew would happen. Right? Yeah. Uh, like Kotaku's article from 2009, the Queen of England's possessive gold-plated Wii. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um. This is, it's a relic of a failed company, guys. <laughs> it is it is more attached to the THQ bankruptcy than it is to anything to do with the queen or the royal family. Right. Uh, because I want to pose, like, uh, hold on. I want to pose a question to you guys, just so we get this out there. Yep. Do you suppose that the carrot of gold is 14 or 24 or like somewhere in between. Well, are you going higher? Whatever low? the literally lowest amount of gold you could 100%. possibly get. One hundred percent. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, and why? It's you probably like that? six cents worth of gold. Because this was legitimately a publicity stunt. I don't even think THQ was under any uh, illusion at the time that Queen Elizabeth would ever get near that box. I also like. If something had real, like, that much gold actually on it, there is no way THQ, a company just, you know, <laughs> losing mo- money by the bucketful every single day would have let that thing out of their sight. That thing would have gone to Hawk real quick. Yeah, it, it would have been like, what, the, uh, that, uh, oh, God, what is it, the the crown and the, the, yeah. the sword and all that shit that got melted down? <laughs> it would literally have been liquidated. Yeah. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Uh, there is a uh, there's a solid gold uh, Game Gear. Johnny, you know more about Game Gear than me. What was the deal with the solid gold Game Gear? I have never heard of that. What are you talking about? There's it's like a limited edition uh, in Europe. I think there were fifty of them. Solid gold Game Gear. I'm telling you, this solid? is a thing, Johnny. I'm t- solid gold. That's a lot of like the it's Game a lot Gear of is gold. already a heavy device. There's no way it is solid gold, like maybe solid gold shell. I forgot it. It was like, I don't know if it was an artist or something. Um, all right, Johnny, we're, we're getting off track here. We're going to go look for so, the solid gold game gear. So something that I want to bring up This episode is pure gold. That's all I <laughs> You're Completely derailing the episode. Now we're talking about more gold. Um, now, Thank one thing that I wanted to me- bring up, though, about this Wii is that I have seen a lot of chatter online about people saying that this, that the entire listing is, is faked. Um, and that it's just trying to capitalize on the like ridiculous f-ing prices we're seeing across the board. Um, 
Uh, the, the guy, I, I, all I can say is that the guy has been claiming to have this thing for a very long time. So it's not like he came out of nowhere and went like, oh, ho, I unearthed this thing this week and now it's the Queen's Wii and now I'm selling it. So like, it obviously he's trying to, to capitalize on the story. Are you and saying there's it. provenance? I Yes, not not the provenance that people like want. Like, like there's nobody like... That there, he has a like a redacted email, which is, I don't know, they, it is what it is. But he has a redacted email from a THQ staffer saying that they believe that this is what it is. But you know, I mean, I think that's as close as you're ever going to get at this point, anyway. But hey, um, I, I want to just point out, like people who think this, this is a bad deal, it does come with the pillow that it sits on for display. I mean, he's throwing right. that in, and a copy of Big Family Games because holy shit, <laughs> that's right? Yeah. That how can you lose? It's a pal all copy I'm of saying, Family Games, though. All I'm saying also, is that, like, don't buy pal games. Just stop it. <laughs> and and I can't, Gross. I can't, I can't uh, speak for the other members of this podcast. But personally, do I believe that this thing is the thing that the guy is saying it is? Yes, I believe this is the one that THQ created. Do I think that it makes a f-ing difference as to whether or not? You know, like Queen Elizabeth didn't own this f-ing thing. So so uh, so I think that that. This the the narrative he's trying to tell is not necessarily authentic, but I do think that like I don't think someone got a Wii gold plated last week and put it on eBay and but saying it was this thing. The Queen is still alive, so you could gold plate a Wii, attempt to send it to the Queen, and then call it a gold plated Wii intended for the Queen, <laughs> and, and it would have the same story on that side. So basically, 100%. it's 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 what is the thq side of this story worth to you like that's do i think that's three hundred thousand dollars hell no can i can i put this into perspective yeah go ahead okay just think about how stupid this is and (laughs) man i I wanted not to say the f word i mean just think for a second just how stupid it is i dropped the f bomb a couple times so far just like it's so incredibly stupid like it Pokemon cards are a dumb thing that people are spending a lot of money on, but this would be like the dumbest. And I just want to just remember, like, just so you guys know, like real history that the Nintendo PlayStation sold for roughly <laughs> what they're asking for Yeah, on this stupid thing. I didn't think about thing. that. I didn't think, think about, about that. Think about this. <laughs> like, well, there's only one Nintendo historic- PlayStation, maybe more. There's only one gold-plated Wii, Johnny. Maybe more if you have like, I don't know, an electroplating machine and have some gold. If you have four dollars <laughs> of gold laying around. <laughs> like, I don't know, if you got really lucky on one of those claw games, you might have enough gold to put in your batch to do Tyler. this. And it, look, and there's all it also comes with a Wii Mote that is also gold dipped. Tyler, what Johnny is saying is we should take a Charizard and mail it to Buckingham Palace. Yes. Gold plated Charizard. I and bet then, there's and like. And then when it comes back, then it's the Queen's fucking Charizard. Uh, like, you got to dip the, the Poke, like, get a Pokeball because there was those Pokeballs that were like. Big oh, yeah. Those are already ones. gold plated. The those King ones are yes. already done. Already <laughs> yes. done. So you take those, you put the card, gold dip <laughs> the card, and then send that. In fact, F that. We don't need gold. Let's platinum dip these bad boys, right? <laughs> wow. Let's really up the stakes and send it out there. And if you really want to get crazy, there's such a chip shortage in California right now. Maybe you could like lace it with like silicon and, and chip parts and uh, really have it be valuable. And and lumber, because apparently that's real expensive right now. Uh, all natural resources are very expensive right now. It's real dumb. <sighs> it's a real dumb thing. It's a real, real stupid thing. Please... Please, if you buy this, at me because I'm gonna ridicule you. I'm I'm, I'm okay with it too. Like, uh, you could be George Lucas, like, and I'm I'm coming for you. I don't. Like, I don't care. I'm 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 obviously like the first one to say that I buy things for stories. A hundred percent, I have paid Absolutely. fucking hundreds of dollars for literal garbage. But uh, so like I I I I suspect that someone will be interested in purchasing it for the for the THQ story but not for the price point that he's asking for. Yeah. Like, that, like that's not that's not a $300,000 story. So uh, like that, I could I could see that being like a $5,000 story. Yes. Right? Like, yeah. Uh, even even maybe 10, you know, in today's climate, who knows. But over $100,000 seems insane. Over $20,000 seems very questionable. Uh, you know, $5,000 seems like okay, that's kind of like you got the queen's wee. All right. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right, guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty funny. They sent it to oh, Buckingham never Palace, it to but it got returned to sender. Now yeah. it's mine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, technically, it just crossed the gate to Buckingham Palace, which we don't even know if it did that because uh, yeah. it might like, be where like is in, the mail, in a mail room. Point. Where yeah. is the picnic table? Probably that they have not set up? in the. Pa- yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably not the palace proper where you could put a bomb. No, know? I'm it, sure. It, it I'm prob- sure if you address something to Joe Biden, they put it right in the White House and then open it up to make yeah. sure it's yeah, good. Yeah, no, it's yeah. in his mailbox, and then he pulls it out, and they're like, yeah. "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" Especially yeah. if it's yeah. an electronic made by a foreign country, like they love just bringing those into yeah. places of government. Mailed from an overseas company. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. yeah, sounds All right. reasonable. All right. Yeah. That. Yeah. So. So now, like, let's get further. Nintendo Wii, intended for Queen, that never even probably made it to Buckingham Palace, definitely went to somewhere in London, though. Made it, made it to a picnic table somewhere in the area. <laughs> Guys, I do want to follow up on my last statement. There was 50 solid gold Game Gears. It had 800 grams of gold, which is around $45,000 of gold in today's market. It sold wow. for 55,000 pounds. And it was marketed as the ultimate present for the children of the super rich. Which is wrong because Game Gear sucks. But <laughs> that did exist. Oh, it's man. incredibly rare and obviously I, very expensive. I, I like that you can't even scrap it for the value in which you paid for it still. <laughs> who, who made it though? Was it just like... It, David Morris International? I don't know what that is. Yeah, so it's not like Sega did this. It's, it's yeah, like no, when this was like a third cars party and they're like, they're like, look, we've got gold doors, and you're like, well, did did they do that themselves? Or, no, it's aftermarket. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, it's a jeweler a that did it. Yeah, yeah. who cares? Yeah. I mean, they have like those diamond crusted iPhones too, and like yeah, Blackberries okay. that were like a hundred thousand dollars. That the ultra rich did pay for at some point. So I mean, good on you if that's a market you can get into. I don't have the capital for that kind of startup. No, there's also the uh, the gold plated analog NT guys. I think that's on eBay for like one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Oh, good analog NT. That's exactly what I want to buy. It'll play. Do you most think we have any of those? Like, like the ultra rich. Do you think we have any ultra rich collectors in this? In this. Scene? Ooh, good topic. No. Mm. Yeah. Well, one, yeah, the guy who bought the the uh, Nintendo PlayStation is not a flipper. He's not looking to invest in it. He one hundred percent is just a rich guy who wants it for his personal museum. Out of everything else that I've seen sell, I don't know any like people buying ninety thousand dollar Pokemon's who were like, "I'm just an ultra rich guy. I'm gonna put this in my collection." Yeah, I wonder who that sold to. That that's interesting. If that was actually the case, I don't remember, but you could look it up. Yeah, he's like a, a big rich collector guy. I'm. Uh, it's no secret that I am a, a Doctor Who fan, and I uh, for a while was trying to like collect Doctor Who props. But you know who else has a very large Doctor Who prop collection and likes to buy Doctor Who props at auction? Peter fucking Jackson. What an ass. So, <laughs> so that's the reason why I stepped away is because there was an ultra rich collector that I was bidding against. So like, that- I am never going to win this war. Yeah. Yeah, uh, how also, am I like, ever going to fight against Peter Jackson? I mean, we talked about this a long time ago, before even WADA and the games market exploded. We're like, you know, if a rich, if an actual rich person ever walked into this collecting and into this hobby and decided they wanted to be a collector, it would be so easy for them to have all the best, best stuff at yeah, uh, a fraction of 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 their expense. You know, they can just, you know. Their, their capital is so far outpaces anything what we're doing over here, even with your your 12 little Samsons or whatever. It, this We don't even touch that. Shit. Like, we're talking about people yeah. who did buy a $100,000 diamond-crusted BlackBerry and iPhone. Like, this, like, oh, your game's $30,000? Neat. Uh, who cares? Sure. I mean, if you're in that level of wealth, it's like video games probably aren't a thing to you. Like, we can no. look at... Uh, 1992 Upper Deck Baseball Cards. You could buy the full set of that for $10, 800 cards. And like, we're like, well, none, none of that's collectible. Why do I want a bunch of five cent cards for? So if you're looking at like f-ing video games, you'd be like, oh, okay, I could get all these Nintendo games for $100 each and have them all awesome. Uh, I'm just going to go over here and invest in art and cars instead. <laughs> well, I mean, th- see, but that supposes that uh, that person doesn't have 
a reason to come into video games, right? Sure. Um, right. So it's they not just that they're it, like Tyler. they can just be an investor, right? I, like they can. That, we're not talking about that. You're speaking on how an investor. We're talking about someone who's like, oh, I I loved games, so I'm going to collect some of these. If where they, where like, are really those people? Of these. John Carmack has a lot of f-ing money. Why isn't he f-ing up the video game market? Why is he over building rockets or whatever he does now? I, I mean, who who knows what they they buy privately? Maybe they don't disclo- disclose that. Then it's not my business, Tyler. <laughs> it's not my business. <laughs> yeah, there's not, not like business. an MTV Cribs for video games. We don't know. Uh, oh, man, there should be. I mean, there is. It's called Instagram. Oh. Uh, Tommy Tallarico, like, he's got a, a small little video game collection, but he's not like crazy. Uh, yeah, because he doesn't have money. He's not making <laughs> hits. <laughs> He's poor. He's one of those poor people. Got a nice house. Sorry, Tommy. I guess maybe we wouldn't even like realize it because I mean, like for instance, like in the in the uh, comic art scene, right? Like there are like like Rob Liefeld, who is you know the the Daredevil or not Daredevil, uh, uh, Deadpool creator. He's allegedly got quite a bit of money at this point. Um, he collects original comic art and like oh, there's I, there's rich people. Think... Like you have people like Seinfeld who have like Superman. Like number one and stuff. Like those those people exist for comics. They're they're old enough and moneyed enough, and that was their thing. Is like they have these items. It's you know, but they're not like they don't give a shit. It's not like they need to go on Instagram to show. It's like a a fun a fun two second note on a talk show when they're being interviewed. Yeah, it sits so in their man not, cave. Right, like that. Just a, a thing they have uh, because they can have. I mean, it's like us, but just on a much larger scale. That's what I'm talking about. Like it. You wouldn't know if the ultra rich were having the best game collections there. There's probably a couple people who do. Like, why wouldn't there be? I mean, yeah. so also people in the game. I don't know how much people in the comic industry make, but if you worked on The Last of Us Two, you're not ultra rich. I don't know who's getting ultra rich on that besides like the publisher. Like maybe some executive is getting ultra rich on that. I don't even know. Like, Nia is Alan Druckmann? Moore ultra rich? I'm thinking like the most popular no, comic Alan. creator. Like, he he can't drop ninety grand. I'm sure on a Pokemon Crystal on a whim. That would still be a f-ing ridiculous purchase. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what it's like anymore. But used to read like used to read in Wizard magazine, and like none of these people, like some of the top guys, like your Mike Maradas and stuff of the day, like they looked like they had some money and they were doing okay, but it didn't look like they were super rich guys. Like they're not, you know, like LeBron James over here making comic books no. and publishing video so, games. Sure. Right. Oh, then, and like, now I want a LeBron James comic book. Can we get that rolling? Probably. I, I'm sure there'll be one for the new space jam movie. <laughs> so like without a doubt, uh, and sports cards to go with it. Don't worry about it. It's going to be great. Is that- uh, no, but like imagine comic creators, right? Like, they couldn't be paid that well. They, some of them probably do fine, but why are all of them sitting at cons, like not even the huge cons, but like cons around the world, like doing signatures for like fifteen and twenty five dollars? That that doesn't smack to me of people who are ultra rich. If people wanted to pay me twenty dollars for a signature, Johnny, I would do it, no matter how much money I had. You aren't <laughs> rich. Damn it. You, you aren't like you don't. When am I going to be so what, rich? I'm out no of touch with the people, Instagram Johnny. I need more money. You of. Like, just imagine, like, just imagine if you made $20, you know, every 30 seconds or something, you wouldn't go, oh yeah, I'm going to go do this. That wouldn't be worth your time. Uh, what if I want to just interface with the people, Johnny? What if I'm well, just a, then a, you a good person probably go and you'd be in like Hall H, right? If you were rich, you'd be in like Hall H and you'd have a panel and you'd talk to like a wide group of people and you wouldn't worry about um, an amount of money that was insignificant to you to, to for them to get some face Maybe time. Maybe I do you the signings for free it. then. Yeah, th- because you loved it. But that's what I'm saying. You would be doing it for free, not for <laughs> okay, $20. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you hear yourself? You're talking yourself out of your own stupid argument. Uh, Jesus God. The uh, Celebrity Age Wiki says Peter Molyneux's net worth is one to five million. That is like one of the most video game man video game names I could think of. Give me another one. Neil Druckmann. Neil Druckmann. Uh, net, his net worth doesn't even come up with a thing, Johnny. Come on. Stop it. Uh, oh, uh, wait. No. 175 name? million on this site. There you go. I mean, Me- Jeff Miyamoto. Bezos technically uh, owns a game studio, so. <laughs> yeah. Neil Druckmann, start f***ing up the video game market. Let's go. What about uh, Johnny's best friend? Um, 
Johnny, it's Johnny's yeah. friend. We're going to look up how much you're worth Palmer and whether you can the video game market. Let's go. Palmer Lucky is not, yeah. not my friend. He is a guy I have, I have interfaced with before and been Palmer. friendly with. <laughs> Palmer, Palmer Lucky, Lucky seems pretty exceptional in terms of video game people. Yeah. Net worth $730 million. Let's yeah. go, Palmer. <laughs> Come on. Uh... And, and he was not worth that when I when I was talking to him. But he, like back in the day, he just had like a modding channel and was like a very successful modder. And now he is like, you know. Like, hey, you want to wear some some glasses and see augmented reality? Cool. He All right. was uh, he was he was trying to get that Nintendo PlayStation. He was. Remember that? Remember was, when he yeah. tweeted, "Who's who's fighting me on the Nintendo PlayStation?" I do. Like a classy fella. That's right. Like, let's have it out. Um, all right, so we're like 30 minutes into the show now or something, 25, and we haven't even mentioned the topic. Uh, well, Tim Schafer's net worth also estimated at one to five million, like doing well for himself, but not. Uh, anyway, what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's a video what, game what man, video game man. Everyone knows Tim Schafer. Yeah, yeah, video game man. Tower of the good word. <laughs> <laughs> he gots them. All the words that good Tyler have best got. All right, so uh, this episode, uh, one of our patrons asked uh, when we were, we have like an episode suggestion thing. So if you're not a patron, uh, you can join for as little as $2 or as much as $6, but not more than that at Collector's Quest uh, or patreon.com slash Collector's Quest. That's it. So if you want to do that, great. If not, totally ignore all that. Anyways, uh, we have this place where you can suggest episodes. And they said, oh, man, you should talk about games that are more expensive uh, than the retail value. And I said, wow, that is like, you know, like more than the retail cost. I'm like, well, that doesn't really factor in inflation. So we'd have to factor in like what inflation was. And like, it's not the same, even though games have been on average about $55 around that. That's the number we're going to use. I know that's not precise for an MSRP, but that's that's a, an adjusted number that we're calling good for most systems. And most systems were always like 200 to 250. So we're like, oh, well. How could you even calculate that, especially now with the today's sealed market? Like if you went back in time and you bought a game in 1986 or whatever, and it was $55, like you bought Final Fantasy, like, great, that's awesome. Uh, even though that's not when Final Fantasy was released, it was after that. But you bought it, it's cool, it's brand new. What would it be worth today if you never opened it and kept it perfectly sealed and you thought, oh, I'm an insane person. And I'm just going to buy video games not to play them. I'm just going to sit on them. Uh, and then, like, I really understand that in 40 years that this is going to become a collectibles market. 30 years, whatever. Uh, so we're going to have this. And now it's now it's worth 20000 because that grading company came out that that's pushing things around so well. Uh, finally, I've, I've done it. I've gotten rich. I, this wasn't the plan of people. So I, I didn't know how to do a good comparison to that. So here's what we did. I said, all right, well, let me look at this. Let me let me look at the inflation, find out the cost of a game uh, for these systems around the midpoint of their, their life cycle at an adjusted number. And then, like, let's see how many games of that system are, you know, above that adjusted cost. And then how many cart only are above that adjusted cost. So, uh, for instance, a Nintendo game, you know, the adjusted cost, if you bought it for $55 in 1985, A6, A7, is now worth about $130. So how many games in the library are actually more expensive than, than that now? Or, or are most Nintendo games less than that? And things that I did, and just so you know, for Nintendo, I took out stadium events out of the equation because that's a huge outlier and it just pumps that number and makes it all ridiculous. So we yeah, excise that. what was it, like that. a delta of like $50, right? Yeah, it was it was real dumb. Like the average value of a loose game went from like sixty dollars to thirty six dollars, from like one hundred and sixty dollars to one hundred and four dollars. So, anyways, we have this. We have some raw numbers. We're not talking about any game in specific. Like you can sort high to low on any any price chart and and see the games that are are high. So we're just going to talk about holistically about these systems and how many like games of that system are above that cost and about how many games total are in that system. So like Nintendo, and we're not counting all the bullshit games, Sachin, I don't care about you. Uh, you know, 600. What's the MSRP on a Sachin game? game? I don't know where they sold who, somewhere. Who Johnny? knows? Yeah. Who knows? Anyway, so we're not factoring that. So we're like, Oh yeah, there's like roughly 670 games here. And, uh, 
117 of them CIB are worth more than the retail cost today. So like that would be a good investment if you bought it, took it home and played it. If you were like half the kids and threw it away, then, you know, only 30 of those loose carts, uh, you know, of that 670 are, you know, above that retail cost. That's, that's how we're going to talk through this stuff. Cool. Is that anybody have any questions? Hands, hands. This is, uh, if you haven't figured this out at home yet, this is absolutely 100% a Johnny episode. Oh my God. You said so many numbers. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that I did. You also talked thing. about sealed games and investing, and that made me scared, Johnny. Uh, well, I, I said no one did that. So, I mean, people. Oh, okay. I'm not fr- I'm not shitting on people who are investors now. Like, whatever, go do your thing. I don't care. Uh, but this is like your average collector who has some games or bought some games. Like, like if you could go back in time, you'd be like, oh, man, if I had kept all my games, would it have been worth it? And the numbers will show you that probably not. Sorry, did you already say that sealed graded is not in this conversation? Yes, I did. Okay, all right. We're not talking about that. Just loose and CIB. Okay. Okay. Yes. And And then um, we'll talk through some key key year points and just like what the overall inflation was according to the U.S. inflation calculator. This is all U.S. dollars, U.S. market, U.S. MSRP. Sorry, everyone who listens from somewhere else. Uh, This is uh, this is how I did it. All right. Cool. cool. Uh, I just want to point out that I forgot what episode it was, but we did give different definitions of collectible. And one of the definitions of collectible, like what is an actual collectible thing, is something that sells for more than it originally sold for. Uh, and there are very many other definitions of collectible, but I guess. So the games we're talking about today are the only these things are the that collectible you collect. video games. Guys. Yes. Yeah. Anything, anything that we're not talking about today, write this down. I know some of you do. Anything we're not talking about today, do not collect. Thank you. Guys, there's a okay. there's a $15 shipped <laughs> Othello for NES on eBay, and it is like super nice, 100% complete. But I know it's not collectible, so I shouldn't buy it. But should I no, buy it? That's so nice. I mean, you shouldn't I mean, buy it because it's Othello. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so think about nice. what a discount that is. $15, and that Othello technically cost at $130 in, yeah. in today's market. That's right. So like, that's a deal. You're getting yeah. a deal on that game. And if it ever flows through the trough of no value, it'll be worth something. That's right. Whoa. Did someone say the trough of no value? I did. Did someone say the trough of no (laughs) value? Do you want to talk about the trough of no value? I think later in the episode, I want to talk about the trough of no value. Okay. My favorite thing. All right. So, um, I I started, we're going to just kind of dig into this real quick. And yes, this is a numbery episode. I like to do, I like to do numbery episodes. Like we can do casual, no research episodes. Whenever, but like sometimes we should sit down and, and like look at the numbers that our hobbies are producing and, and give people some facts. So that's one of these episodes. Uh, welcome to Edutainment. We did 30 minutes of bits. If you were in our pre show, you got to hear a bunch of nonsense. Um, but this is where we, we get, you know, into the business of numbers. Don't so, worry, guys, I'll try to throw in some bits anyway. <laughs> please, yeah, please don't. <laughs> no, no, throw in your bits wherever you wish. Uh, that's <laughs> what you said. Um, okay. Uh, Tyler, do you want me to start this off? Do you want to talk about the global inflation over these key years we picked, or do you want to go right into a system? What do you, what do you want first? Oh my God. I think we should go over the inflation numbers right before we go over an associated console, Johnny, because, oh my God. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Okay. I'm going to start off and then, uh, Tower and then Stefan, you can, you can take one. We'll, we'll just kind of. Go like that. So the Nintendo, as I already said, released 1985. Uh, I want you to know that in 1985, $55, uh, or in 1985, $55 spent uh, in today's money, 2021, would be worth uh, about $135. But that adjusted into like the 1986, 1987, 130 is what I called it. Like I said, for one um, video yeah, game, Johnny, $130. For one video game, yeah. Can you imagine Jesus. that you were paying a hundred th- those sixty dollar games and sixty nine dollar games for PS Five? Now they seem like a deal, right? They, like, I mean, they, they they do do, yeah. And you I know mean, what that's... you're buying? You're not buying like Back to the Future Two and Three, and it's like, oh my god, Mom, you bought Back to the Future Two and Three? Damn it! Yeah, and like Goonies Two, it only took me two hours to beat it after I learned what to do. This sucks. <laughs> um, yeah. So, anyways, the average loose game right now costs about $36. Uh, the average CIB is about $104. So how many of those loose carts are worth over $130? Guys, 
30 cartridges. 30. <laughs> oh, 30. Only I 30. feel like I'm cheating because I'm just looking at the spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. there's only 30. So there's 30 and how collectible many CIB? cartridges on NES. Yeah. Yeah. So how many CIB are above that $130 value? 117. Wow. And the average loose cart cost in that 30 is around uh, $317. The average CIB cost is about $362. So you can see that the bulk of that number that are above are like high above. So it's not like sitting on the, on that, you know, average value, which is about $104. It, it's well, it's marketably above that. So, uh, the NES, you know, you can get a pretty good swath of, uh, games. There's, you know, hundred ish games, 117 games that you can go buy for that system that, uh, are bona fide collectibles by that definition. So that's pretty cool out of uh, 670. That seems super high to me. Um, I mean, and obviously because of the past two years, but just like, yeah. there were, there were not always 117 NES games that were over a hundred dollars. Yeah, no, there used to be like thirty. <laughs> yeah, crazy. No, I know that. But so, be, so the the when I set up my like display case of 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 NES games, and granted these are these are loose, but like, um, but like I had that like on the the top tier games were uh were um on literally the top shelf, and like there certainly weren't a hundred and seventeen of them on that top shelf. <laughs> well, that loose there's only thirty though, so. That's fair. Uh, stadium events was on the top shelf, Johnny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and if stadium events was in here, then like just uh, the number just like you tick those numbers up, the CIB above like one, but then the prices are like the average value becomes stupid. Uh, anyways, Tyler, tell me about Super Nintendo. Uh, came out in 1991, a year where 55 1991 dollars are worth 107 real dollars in 2021. Uh, average loose value of a Super Nintendo game right now is 35 same as a, an NES game. Average complete in box value, $107, same as an NES game. Weird, because I, I've, I see people, like, compl not complain, but, like, mention, like, no one is super excited about Super Nintendo. There's, like, NES, all, people have always been excited about NES, and now, over the past few years, like, N64 and GameCube has gotten stuff, and everybody loves Super Nintendo. I just... I see more enthusiasm for it. other consoles. Yeah, I absolutely. Mean, People are much louder about other systems. Except for like the top, top, like common SNES stuff. Everyone loves that, right? I mean, I yeah. feel like when I came into the hobby, which is now, what, what, 2015? Does that sound about right? It was right, like four John? days ago. Yeah, you know. Uh, I feel like uh, SNES was super hot at that time, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it gets waves, but it's never, it never hit those peaks. Like, N64s have, like, four peaks, you know? Super Nintendo has just been, like, this quiet burn. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I told you, people have been stealth buying Super Nintendo games. It's very hard to find nice condition Super Nintendo games right now. So I don't know if that's investors have just been quietly sucking up uh, nice box games or what. Yeah, Danielle. Give me a Chrono Trigger. <laughs> I don't. I think she listens to our show. <laughs> no, I know. That's why I said it. Uh, Give me a Chrono Trigger. 35 cartridges uh, on SNES above... Uh, what What is this chart again? MSRP? It's a, a, above MSRP. Yeah. 35 collectible cartridges. Uh, we're joking about that, but this is like... If you haven't been able to figure it out, we're, we're joking about the only things being collectible being the ones above MSRP. Um, and 154 complete box games above MSRP which uh, blows away the NES number. That is definitely statistically significant. And again, interesting to me because I generally think that there's more collectible, like, you know, quote unquote collectible NES games than Super Nintendo games, but there are more expensive Super Nintendo games. Yeah. And like, and just so you know, like I cut it off strictly at that $107, but there's another like uh, down to like, if you just dropped it $10, there's like another 20 games sitting there waiting to be included in that number yeah wow do do you think that that has anything to do with the number of role-playing games on the super nintendo i um, yes <laughs> probably but like if if you look at some of the games so like if i went down to the 107 marker right like arrow the acrobat 2 sonic blast man mighty morphin power rangers you know Box. castlevania air cavalry earthworm gm 2 super smash tv 
Super Smash TV is over one hundred and seven dollars. One hundred and nine dollars. <laughs> and again, I want to just give like one huge caveat. These numbers come from Game Value now, a website that is dog <laughs> kinda. You know, it's just like I, I, I'm trying not to rant. I'm trying. I'm so I'm, I'm trying to. Let's rant. wait. Let's wait Try- till after we're done with all the data. How about before we talk about some Game Value now stuff? Okay, I'm just saying. I'm I'm throwing it out there that. Their data is iffy, but this is the best we can do. This is still the best site we have. Price charting is, is the exact same thing. You can switch one for the other. They both have problems. It doesn't really matter. This is what we used. This is how we created our metric. It's just to have a discussion. You don't need to focus on all the bad data. I'm this saying is, this, this more for me. Mantra. Johnny is saying, yeah, I was going to say, Johnny is saying this for himself right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Average uh, Super Sorry. Nintendo cart. Uh, that is above one hundred and seven dollars. Is two hundred and forty one dollars? Is that the how much more dollars it is above one hundred seven, or is that the average cost? That's the that's the average of those ones that are above okay. of, above MR, MSRP. That's how much. That's the average value of those ones. Two hundred forty one. Okay. And then the average so. collectible complete in box Super Nintendo game. I'm just going to call them collectible. Uh, is three hundred dollars. So those numbers. So uh, the carts on NES were three hundred seventeen versus two hundred forty one on SNES. And complete in box was 362 on NES versus 300 on SNES. So NES expensive stuff is still worth a good bit more than Super yeah, Nintendo. Yeah, like you get your little Samson that's that. still like, like the top Super Nintendo game is still like Super Mountain Bike, you know, uh, like Mountain Bike Rally Speed take, Racer. Yeah. yeah which know, is garbage. Is, <laughs> right. And this was me taking out like competition cards too. And like Hagan, right? And Arrow Fighters. These are only like. Again. When you look at these things compared to like you take out your fighters? little Samson, no, wait, Hagane and Arrow Fighters, like there's nothing weird about them. Wait, no, no, I what didn't did you take I didn't out. Take, I didn't take out Hagan. I said I took out the competition cards. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So just because I felt like people will fight on those and they don't really matter, uh, but they're, they're like two of the most expensive games. So I just excised them and just kept it like strictly retail stuff, um, and. Like, this is still the average, but like, you have a $1,500 game, you have a bunch of games that are like $1,000, like five or six. But Super or Nintendo, you get like, you get a little Samson in there, which, and like Flintstones, which just crush those. So, Super Nintendo's peak is not as high as Nintendo's peak. Yeah. But there's more of them, you know, there's more of that middle ground that uh, hits the value. The value. The value. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, rejoice in the value, Tyler. Rejoice in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Stefan, tell us about everybody's uh, favorite system, including yours, N64. Yes, this garbage system for garbage people came out in 1996 when the uh, when your dollar spent uh, at $55 would now be $87. Uh, average value for loose is twenty nine dollars. Average value for CIB is eighty eight dollars. Uh, there are a whopping twelve games that are above the threshold loose, and that's 80... like the entire library. The, no, that's what I'm saying. So this, the the next number is what blew my f- mind when I was sitting here. Eighty three. There are 83 titles CIB that are above the threshold. That's a third of the library. That is bananas to me like that's pretty f-ing crazy a third it is a that's a big number it is a big number yeah, probably I'm the biggest on this entire list that we were about to go over but it by, is by percentages by far, i'm yeah. sure it has to be because yeah, there's like far. 700 nes and super nintendo games yeah exactly. you're like talking a about fifth. like a, a sixth or a, a sixth or a seventh for snes or or nes yeah, imagine there's only like three there's less than 300 like licensed games yeah. right 296 96, yeah, yeah. 83, 83 games above the threshold. Yeah, a um, third. A third of the games. It's so bananas. Roughly. Yeah. Guys in the Some of those have thing. to be racing games, ass racing games, ass sports games. Oh, my God. But but their peak is very low. The peak is so low. Like, yeah. their best game is, is, or their best game, their most expensive game is Clay Fighter, Sculptor's Cut, nobody's favorite or best game. Nope. And that's like $2,000. You know, two thousand. But you know, Wait, who knows? People I don't. Are. I literally don't know if you're trying to say complete or loose at this point. Complete, but that would that's old. There's no way. Data. That's, yeah, that's old data, big. and like not, I, I know it just spiked again recently to like four thousand dollars. But that you you get the point. Yeah. 
Uh, anyway, uh, average loose cost above the threshold, $183. Average CIB cost above the threshold, $208. Did you Those... throw out S- Sculptor's Cut as an outlier? No, I did not. I left it in because that is like just, it, it, it's its peak game. So I'm not going to crush the peak. What are you going to say, Tyler? Um, I was going to say that those numbers for the loose games and the complete games are fairly close, but the, the threshold for... No, that's still weird. That Those are pretty close, right? What? What's happening? What are you asking? I, you're, Does this you're data... Mumbling. I'm trying to... I'm going to cut this. Are... I don't understand why this data matters. I'm just going to cut my confusion here. Don't worry about it, Johnny. All right. Which data are you concerned about? There are 12 cartridges that average $183, and there are 83 complete and box games that average $208. The cartridge price still seems too high to me. Yeah, let but me... it's because I'm just thinking about normal cart versus complete prices. Yeah, I, I can go into the actual doc. Because it's just that the the complete in box prices, it's just a, a bigger sample of games. So there aren't, it's not just like the tippy tippy yeah. top games. It's stuff that's barely over the $88 mark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, Sculptor's Cut is driving some of that. What are these? Yeah, there's not very many. So there's only, only these 12, right? And when, yeah, the average is, yeah, I got the average right in here. Um, yeah, it's you have games that like Stunt Racer and Super Bowling and WC uh, Bomberman. You know their their carts are like two hundred dollars still, mm. like two eighty uh, three hundred dollars. Johnny, so, did I, did I see many. a sculptor's cut sell for sixteen hundred dollars on eBay? Am I making that up? Um, I don't loose, know. I, I mean, <laughs> oh, wow, sculptor's loose. cut has been wacky over the last like week. Uh, I think a lot of people would say Sculptor's Cut has been wacky over the past 15 years because it's a Nintendo 64 game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't understand the carts that are selling for $1,500. I've literally sold, uh, it's like one of the few games I ever sold that I like $7,500. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's an auction that ended three days ago for $1,650 and uh, a bunch of buy it nows at $1,000, $1,200, 1000 1600 <laughs> Yeah, we we got people. I, Go ahead. I remember talking to the Super Video Game Bros guys a couple. You know, it's been a few years now, but we're talking about Sculptor's Cut when loose card. It was like you know four hundred dollars, and uh, just <laughs> them t- lamenting the fact that uh, they used to like have those. They'd sell those like all day in the store for like forty dollars a pop. And like as he was telling me the story, you could just hear the "Hello, darkness, my old friend" <laughs> like in the background. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> they, they gotta feel extra worse now that it's like people are asking over two thousand dollars and fifteen hundred dollars for this. Someone's asking twenty thousand dollars for a CIB right now. That like what what is going on in this world? Like I want people to understand. I wouldn't put a buy now on sculpt- fucking anything, Johnny. <laughs> are you kidding Look, me? Sculptors cut is such hot trash. It is, the, you're never, like, it, also, like, when people flash their sculptor's cut, I'm not impressed. I just think you're sad. <laughs> it's like, aw, that's a sad trophy. Like, hmm. yeah, you got a trophy, but it's like, when everybody gets a trophy, that's how I feel about sculptor's cut. Uh, I just want to give some context uh, to this. Uh, if you're not following the sculptor's cut price, which you shouldn't, like the crazy coronavirus prices <laughs> you, have been. You shouldn't. It's like been in like the eight hundred dollar range. That was a spike, so it's spiking to like sixteen hundred dollars out of nowhere. Is even crazier than it's been in Corona times. It still is Corona. I'm saying it like Corona times is over. Like we're still here, guys. I don't know what's going on. Another crazy yeah. sale. A little Samson sold today for like three thousand dollars. Just a loose cart, and it wasn't in mint shape. So I don't know what is going on. Yes. So just so you know, right now is May first, right? And apparently at the end of April, uh, people were like, you know what hasn't been crazy enough? Prices of video games. <laughs> Let's go nuts, guys. Let's do this. I know we got to pay taxes soon, but who cares? Like I don't know what's happening. What, I don't have to pay taxes right now till next April, Johnny. Let's go. Woo. Let's, I don't know, I, manipulate I some markets, know, get some capital gains. Like, you know what I don't want to see uh, on a video game that's like $1,500? When someone has to put in bold on their auction description, 
read description. I'm like, oh God, I, you're, you want $1,500 and I have to go look at some bullshit you put in the description? Holy shit, what is wrong with this thing? Are you looking at the first Sculptor's Cut listing on eBay? I don't know. Oh, because there's a $1,350 uh, Sculptor's Cut with a read description. It's uh, It looks like it was dropped in a toilet. It's got some scotch tape on it and a little tiny piece ripped off the label. T Sweet. Tyler, goodbye. Going back to something you said a second ago, it just reminded me. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, Eric Nehemiah, the the VVG Club guy, the the dentist, uh, had a, a live stream where he was talking about like I don't know why more people aren't more vocal about the the prices that they're paying for this stuff. And the first thing I thought of was just like uh, tax evasion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why people aren't more vocal because I don't want to be embarrassed. That I spent this much money That's on a my, really my terrible game. My personal reason is embarrassment, but also like I don't have a vested interest in trying to pump a market up. <laughs> like I've got it. I'm not gonna. I'm not you here know, to, to flaunt how much I paid for it and try to get people to pay more for it now. Tyler, the uh, the episode song we need is we need eight bit version of Pump Up the Jam for this. Um, pump up sure. The jam. Can we? Uh, we need a Johnny. We need a theme song because I sent you a theme song. <laughs> yeah, but well, go find that MP3 file and and because I don't uh, know where it is. It's literally, Johnny. it's literally in the folder. Like I can send right. it to you anytime you want it. All right, it's in the. Folder. We went through this before. You're like, I can't find it, and then Let's I put it in it. the folder, and you're like, We got a theme know. song, guys, because it's going to be used for this episode. Because uh, no, it's no, I it's hate not. finding music, and I don't think it sounds as professional as just having a song. Woo! Our Woo. music is interesting. See, it's because you don't put any love into it. You just like go find something. Uh, and you're like, oh, okay. Do you yeah, know how I long thought, I spend uh, looking for music? <laughs> Yeah, but you don't love the process. Is my point. Uh, 100%. Like when I was, when I was doing it, I was like, man, what's like a cool, like what song can I find that represents like some joke or like something significant about this episode that is very satisfying for the people who find it. And you're just like, I guess we talked about gold, so I'll put on that song that mentions gold twice. All right, cool. That's what I do. If I don't know, I don't know pop music very well, so I just th I look up like songs that mention money. Songs about prices crashing. <laughs> like I can hear you googling it now, and the, so when I say you don't love it and you want to fight me, and then you're like, oh, "I hate this." Like, how are you over here trying to argue with me? Uh, and then like it. So not only are we finding like obscure songs about specific things, then I have to find like someone's shitty eight bit remix of it and steal it off YouTube. And it's like, oh, this is like the saddest eight bit remix. <laughs> Let me find like the best part of the song that, uh, and then we're just gonna play for ten seconds because it's really bad. <laughs> Meanwhile, you turn on Retronauts and you get that bop. So GameCube. <laughs> well, what's GameCube? <laughs> you get that bop. What do you what what language is this? I was just trying to speak Gen Z for a second. I know. I know. It was and really I oop, sad. You know? Oh, do you oop? <laughs> I don't really know what that means. Yeah, oh, I do. <laughs> and I, I think it means you, I you messed don't oop. up. Yeah, you know, big oop. yikes, cringe. <laughs> yeah, big yikes, super cringe. Uh, yeah, no, thank you, Tyler. All right, <laughs> uh, let's talk about GameCube. Uh, 2001, we're, we're getting more reasonable. Your $55 is now uh, $79.80. Oh, that's that's not too bad. So, uh, loose discs, we don't do that. Stop that. Do not buy loose discs. Stop it right now. Stop it. Use the voice. That I use on my dog when he's being bad for you people buying loose discs. Yeah, I was gonna say Knock we need a, we need, we need a spray bottle those. for those people. Yeah. Shh, no, bad. Shh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so GameCube, you should only be looking and any disc system, it's gonna be this way. We're only gonna talk about CIB values. So there's uh the average cost is about thirty-eight dollars for a GameCube CIB. So they are about half the cost of what it would be uh if you were buying new. But how many are above that, you know, $80, 60, which is like a pretty good number. And that average cost is about $175. GameCube has been hot lately. So that it's, as prices are going up, I, I'm surprised that there are, um, 60 games over $80 now on the GameCube, but you know, honestly, when you lay it out like this, when you're like after inflation, it's 80 bucks and the average game after uh, the average game today is 40 bucks. It's like, Oh. Average game's half the price that it costs back when I bought it. You make it sound reasonable, but GameCube is like absolutely a dumpster fire compared to like a year ago even. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that cost a year ago, the average cost uh, of a game would have been like $20, not $38. Sure. 
or what I mean, it probably would have been like 30, but still. Um, but yeah, the and the peak on GameCube like kept rising too. It wasn't like you know, hundred dollar games became three hundred dollar games and fifty dollar games just became hundred dollar games. So that it, it's uh, yeah, the the peaks have been high. Anyways, let's uh let's return to a a gentler time. Tell me about a system from 1989, Tyler. Oh, 1989. The Sega Genesis, which we don't have explicit uh, inflation data for. We're just using the 1991 because yeah. that's right in the middle of Sega Genesis. People didn't buy yeah. Sega Genesis until Sonic the Hedgehog came out anyway, right? Who cares about Altered right. Beast? Uh, 1989, Sega Genesis, we're going to say year $55 during that lifespan was about $107. Uh, average complete in box value. Oh, we actually did cards for this? Average loose value of a Genesis cartridge is $17. Shout out to uh, some of our listeners who are still buying carts. Uh, yes, we get messages from you guys. And uh, definitely, you should keep buying loose Sega Genesis cartridges. They look and feel great. Average com- and they display so well on a shelf. <laughs> God damn. Uh, the average complete inbox Sega Genesis game is $46. It just seems so that? That's reasonable. so low. Yeah, like how, <laughs> that, man, that sounds so great, except when you find out like the bottom of the barrel is like oh 200 God. games, all like $6 <laughs> like, each. I, I've got like two solid shelves of EA Sports and like, yeah. oh my God. Uh, how many loose cartridges are above uh, that $107? There are two. I can two. name them. Uh, Musha <laughs> and Crusader of Senti and uh, Outback Joey's not a Sega Genesis game. Come at me. Um, uh, yeah, also excluded from the value. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we we did exclude that because it is an outlier. How many complete and box Sega Genesis games? Uh, what? How many Sega Genesis games are there? There's like 700. I I should know. Yeah, 722 ish. Uh, 51. No, no, like 706. It's like 706 or something for Genesis. Okay, there's 51 above 107 dollars, which is the lowest out of any of these consoles, including GameCube. Uh, which is crazy to me because Genesis yes. was hot. Uh, like it. it well, actually, if you uh, if you look at a Sega Genesis box and you look at the very top, you'll see that it says uh, uh, Sega. That's why it is not as expensive as Nintendo games. Oh, is that is that the root cause? That's the root. I figured it out. We can close oh. this case. Huh. <laughs> the average- I've been curious about this like for so long and you just made it sound so easy. I was <laughs> like, man, what is happening over there? Like the the fall off is pretty big after Crusader of Senti. Man, what happened with Crusader of Senti? Do you do you remember like this game was hot and it was like, but not Musha hot. It was like I don't know, five hundred dollars and Musha was like pushing that number two and they were kind of fighting for that top spot. But now Crusader of Senti, like I think people have said it's the Zelda of the Genesis and now it's just like seventeen hundred dollars. No, I think what's happening is uh, people are investing in the best stuff. And they they're going deep on Nintendo stuff and they just look at Sega and they're like, oh, f- Sega, what's the most expensive Sega game? I'm just going to get those. And so they're just buying Crusader of Senti and like maybe like Musha or something. But like they don't care about the 10th rarest Sega Genesis game. They're not like buying Elemental Master. They're just like, yeah, give me Crusader of Senti if that's the stadium events of Genesis, which it's not. But uh, it is a very popular and uncommon game. Rare game yeah. is Crusader of Senti rare. We can yeah, maybe it's kind of rare. rare it's it, it's kind of rare, and like okay. people still have misinformation about this. Uh, it is a cardboard box only game. Uh, uh, our buddies over um, oh god uh, at Racket Boy released their like updated Genesis hot games, you know, rare and collectible ones, and they actually had listed it as being you know a game that came in a clamshell, and they didn't realize. That, you know, people just cut up the cardboard box and slammed it in a, in a clamshell because people are like, yeah, I found one and it comes in a clamshell. And this is like a fight I've had for a long time. Not that Racket Boy fought me at all. They immediately fixed their article and good on them for that. But it's cardboard box only. They, people just cut that box up or printed their own cover. So that's kind of where the spike for Crusader of Senti comes. Because to get it nice is hard to do because, you know, those Genesis cardboard boxes are garbage. Garbage. Anyway, uh, now that there's $1,600, everyone go invest in Crusader Senti. It's a great idea. I, it's You know what's crazy is there are some like that these are the only games that are like there. You figure there would be like five or ten. Like, yeah, I figured Castlevania would have like spiked over that. You know, like both the splatter houses. I mean, these, these are, we're I talking about loose carts, and I think so many people just ignore loose cartridges for Genesis. Not, yeah. not like to like poo-poo on loose cartridges. It's just that the boxes are so readily available for almost all this stuff. 
That's true. That's a fair point. Like Crusader Ascenti is both really rare and only had the cardboard box, which is so easy to get damaged or lose. So yeah, that's something. And Musha probably was underproduced. Uh, maybe. I don't know what's up with Musha. Um, anyway, average of the uh, loose carts above the $107 mark is $247, which is the average of Musha and Crusader Ascenti. That's a pointless metric. Average of the... 51 complete in box games above $107 is $207. Man, so... And that's being drug up a lot by Crusader of Senti. Like, if if we pulled Crusader out, that number drops a lot. All right. Hi. I'm back. No, we didn't We didn't realize you were gone. It's okay. Good. <laughs> that's the 10,000... The top 51 Genesis games is $10,000. Yep. Jeez. Oof. Stefan, would you like to uh, would you like to talk about Sega CD? How come I get all the garbage? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> groundbreaking, almost as groundbreaking as a TurboGrafx CD system. Oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm talking to Tyler. I'm sorry, Sega Saturn is the garbage system. Mm, maybe more garbage than Sega CD. That's what I'm saying. That's Ooh, not true. <laughs> I know your opinions. Can we talk about fucking those AM2 arcade ports? <laughs> suck. See. See? Yeah, and, and for all those asking why we didn't do Turbo Graphics, all three of you. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Master, Andrew. Jeff Master, if you're, eyes, if you're wondering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hyrule Vise, if, if you're curious, Andrew, why we didn't. Also, because those things are start going to be graded by Wada soon, and you're going to start to see more of that happening. Mm. So all that data is going to become real bad after they that. Already, so. I, I don't, maybe it's like a test run that they're doing, but I have seen Yeah, some they started to. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like... I mean, w- wait till a big one hits the market, you know, and to heritage. I- I'm I'm this, waiting to like Johnny, really this has talk already about happened. Just so you know, like a Bonx Adventure sold for ten thousand dollars, and those are what? not rare. No, no, they are not. Yeah, nope. we're in the we're in the future. Let's talk about Turbo uh, Graphics. Scrap Sega CD. No one cares. We're gonna start talking no, about Turbo Graphics S- games, guys. Stefan, please tell us about Turbo Graphics. I mean Sega CD. <laughs> that's what you deserve. You fell into Tyler's trap. Uh, <laughs> Sega CD coming out in 19... Ni- screaming out in 1992. Yeah. Uh, uh, the adjusted cost. So for your, for your $55, today you'd be spending $107, identical to the Genesis. Average loose value is for f***ing monsters. You don't buy loose discs. You don't buy loose discs. We are probably already talked about that. Uh, don't do that. Uh, average value for CIB, 150 bones. How many Holy above? Sh- that's across the price? entire library? Yeah, 150. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. The library of 20 games. How many above our threshold for CIB is, lost my place, 37. 37 above the f- threshold for CIB. Average loose cost, we're not talking about, but average CIB cost, $300 for you, my friends. $300 average CIB out. above $107 is 300 that must mean that the cheapy bullshit Sega CD games are extremely expensive if the average is still 150. Well, yeah, I would. I would could say get into, generally, we could the, get into how how messed up the data is and how uh-huh. Bill Walsh College Football is still listed at two dollars and forty six cents for a complete one, which you could not actually achieve <laughs> a CIB for. And a sim- <laughs> is this the time? Is this the time when it breaks through? Where Johnny breaks loose? <laughs> It's, I, there's, there's uh, yeah, take uh, take games. all this data with like uh, you know ten grains of salt because it's from price tracking sites which have not been doing great the past couple which of were, years. Which were purchased and then uh, not updated. Uh, I mean, I, price I, charting's I, not doing any better than Game Value now, so no, can't they're, really. They're, they're all I'd, garbage. I, believe me, I would love to blame Go Collect 100, percent Stefan, but I can't because price charting's not good either. That's oh, they're all bad. All of our, all the data is so bad so bad and you can't trust ebay either everything is obfuscated Just, however okay. tyler i would say that clean cibs for the long box disc based systems like sega cd and sega saturn do tend to have a higher floor like they do absolutely. i mean i guess that I mean, makes sense ca- i mean because the case that's what i'm saying like the case alone like people who just upgrade their cases if you have like if you found a bill walsh for ten dollars, and you needed a case for your Panzer Dragoon, you'd just be like, even though the the cases are technically a little bit different, and you shouldn't do that. Um, you would buy it. You'd just be like, I'll just spend the ten dollars on this, and that's 
It, they're so hard to get because every time you ship one of these things, they're going to crack. They're going to get damaged. They're so hard to keep nice. So that's what yeah. I'm saying. Like the mm-hmm. average. The, uh, speaking like speaking that of cases are ten dollars by themselves. Yeah, I was going to say similarly. I mean, Turbo is kind of the same for yeah. CIC collectors, right? So if any, anybody who doesn't collect Turbo may not know, but like at, at a certain point, they stopped using jewel cases in, ter- in the interior of the packaging. So there's no uh, there's no jewel cases. For actually, some of the higher end games too have no actual jewel cases. So people buy the cheap jewel case games because they have like uh, inserts that are particular to the console. They buy those cheap CIB or the the, the cheap uh, like what TV games and all those sports games that are that were cheap. Those are the the floor is kind of coming up on on Turbo because people are cannibalizing the cheap games for jewel cases so that all of so their sets look nice on a shelf. Hey guys, I've got a, a pro tip if you do that. Um, so what like Air Zonk is one of those games, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you're collecting CIC Turbo and you can't get uh, an Air Zonk because it would either just be loose or you'd have to get it fully complete. Just get it fully complete. What are you doing? You could like you collect turbo already. Don't tell me it's too expensive. If it was too expensive, you wouldn't be collecting turbo games. But is that even true anymore? Remember when that was true when turbo was just so expensive? But now now everything is so expensive. It, it doesn't even matter yeah, now, anymore. Now it's That's just true. the middle of the pack. The uh, the irrelevance of turbo graphics has been Now it's uh, like N64. Good bare. golly. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Man, if you don't have that, like, would you rather have a super awesome, like, super air zonk or bowling, Brunswick bowling or whatever, super bowling, super bowling, on the Johnny, N6, super bowling on the N64? Come on. Ooh. Yeah, like, I mean, magical chase. Yes, super expensive. Don't get me wrong. Also, a fairly competent shooter. <laughs> like, it's a good game. No, um, go get your go get your sculptors cut. This is what we're talking about. It's like sculptor's cut is more than magical chase now. What in the world happened? It actually is, right? Like, I don't even think you're joking. I think that's true. I, I mean, yeah. if you're looking at their prices, I, I also have not looked at a magical chase in a long time. I'm, I'm hoping it it's more expensive than a sculptor's cut. I'm checking. Oh, my God. I'm checking to see if any if any magical chases uh, are actually... Oh, yep. You can buy one for fifteen thousand or best offer. So I imagine you can get that for twelve, right? And it would be less expensive than a CIB sculptor's cut in this market. Hmm. Uh, yeah, probably. don't do. Yeah, this is insane. Comes with the insert. Insane. Someone pick up this magical chase. It's in a uh, bad condition, <clears throat> but who cares? Yeah, you card manual. Case. You card and manual sold. Uh, well, there's a, it's a blizzard. For, well, it doesn't look like it. The buy it now thing really f***s with me. But there was a, maybe it was triggered for the buy it now. But uh, uh, April second, a uh, magical chase with just Hugh card and manual sold for seventy five hundred dollars on the eBay's. Yeah. So I mean, and that used to be, that combo so, alone used to be. There 5, you go, $5, Tyler. $5. There's there's a reason why you buy a f***ing jewel case and put it in there. The how about the like five thousand dollar Delta? That's why. <laughs> what you what are you talking about stop it oh uh, okay so no stop it you have to get magical chase just get the box just don't yeah, collect turbo just, graphics just you, just spend the extra five thousand dollars just spend and the extra why five am i the fat buying? cat when tyler is saying <laughs> just spend, spend the, the extra five thousand dollars for a cardboard box uh, yeah what just happened tyler's talking about poor people and i Steph know is like stuff is like money matters save your tokens uh, kids what is happening? It's five thousand dollars. It's versus seventy five hundred dollars on like a sad uh, Hugh Card Emanuel version. Like, why is it sad? It's, it's sad. sad. It has no place to live. If you buy, it if you make a, uh, a basically reproduction case for it, then it's just on. like, oh, my seventy five hundred dollar game has an asterisk hold on. next Tyler, to it. Tyler, stop it. Let me let me be the Tyler that the show needs. Okay. Why don't you just buy the real first print from Japan where you can get it for $800? Yeah, way, way less. That I is mean, certainly true. because it's not going to complete your set because you need all the American stuff. That's why. What, what the is, true what first print. to Tyler? Don't worry about... Yeah, like, what the hell is happening? Tyler did he has just argue? All his Tyler is. Did he just... Uh, yeah, he just abandoned Japan and went to no, America? No, just like, I knew that if I said that, it would cut Johnny's point out. But yeah, don't buy Turbo Graphics games. Just buy oh, yeah. PC Engine. What's wrong with you? Yeah, just cool. Just make bad faith arguments. That's great. <laughs> what? <laughs> Super responsible. 
Yeah. All right. No, no. We're we're a show dedicated to uh, educating our listeners. But yeah, that's cool. Like, okay. No. Back to is. the point. Point at hand here. A seventy five hundred dollar magical chase. As if like any of us are buying this right now. Although I think Johnny bought one for seven anyway. With just the cart and manual, is it's like. It's it's sad and incomplete versus fifteen thousand dollars for the actually complete one that you don't have to like think about and have it bother you. And Johnny's you really good at not having dumb shit 8, bother him. Thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, but so it, I'm saying the better option in this case is to just not buy it then and just say like, all right, I don't have magical chase, but whatever. No one has magical chase. I, I have Turbo Graphics minus I hate magical you. chase. I hate you. <laughs> all you're doing, you're just gonna. It, it makes. Just as much sense to spend seventy five hundred dollars to check a box as it does to pay for a cardboard box. Like you're just checking a box with magic. You don't think it's a seventy five hundred dollar game. You're just checking the fucking box. Ooh, Tyler busted out the f word. You got to him. You're under a skin, Stefan. Keep I going. I, I got there. I, I'm picking at the scab. What's this episode about? <laughs> I don't even know. talking it's about, about Turbo <laughs> It's about magical chase. You wanted to talk about Turbo so bad, here we are. Oh I my know. God. You're welcome. I, I took the bait and then punched you in the face. All right. So I bit you like your dog. We, we, uh, <laughs> Ponyo strikes back. All right. right. Uh, we, that was the Sega CD, guys. Um, <laughs> and was it? Yeah, kind of. It was. <laughs> Sega. Let's talk about Sega CD's cooler older brother, uh, the Sega Saturn, 1994. Hey, wait, wait, 50- wait, wait, What's the what's the expensive game for Sega CD? I like legitimately don't know. Uh, they're Sega's like um, Koei Space Adventure. Oh, that um, no, those are like actually like the top like five games on the Sega CD are actually kind of Snatcher, Space Adventure, Popful Mail. I uh, like Ooh. a dumb one is like Radical Rex, but um, Make sure like Koei and Snatcher are awesome. Popful Mail, Lord K-O, of Thunder. K.O. Flying Squadron. K-O, Why do you pronounce I, things yeah. weird? Hagane. Why do you, Hagane. Man. Because I am super American. And actually, you, I've already discussed this on the show, how like phonetically, I don't know how to say things because I Simple had bad sounds. hearing and a speech defect. Thanks yep. for bringing yeah. it up, though, Tyler. <laughs> no problem. This is, I, if yeah. I correct You're engaging you, though, in hate speech right now, Tyler. It's hate speech. God. Yeah. I'm sorry that my ears were damaged and I was legally deaf as a child. And then, I'm sorry like, you're an ableist piece of shit. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're here, Stefan. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having my back. Yeah, always. Unlike thanks. Tyler, <laughs> talking down to poor people, you know, no. flaunting his privilege. I get it. God. Anyways. Uh, the cooler older brother I wanted to talk to you about was the Sega Saturn, Mm. which came out in 94. Uh, These are American release dates. No one at me with the Japanese release dates, please. Um, just imagine if you wanted to know the Japanese release date, like go a year earlier. That's like typically what it was. Um, anyways, your $55 is now $96 and the average value of Saturn. And this sounds crazy to me is only $86. Does that sound crazy to you guys for CIB? For Saturn? No, it sounds like a lot of goddamn money. Yeah. I mean, uh, but Saturn let me, was let me always tell you about expensive. the Sega Saturn library. A lot of it is junk, Johnny. Yeah, I, I know. I, You and I both have this library still. Yeah. And you've got, and like, it, the nice shelf of Saturn games of, like, all those cool games everyone thinks is super cool on Saturn. And then it's like, oh, cool. Well. Well, I think this is also sort of similar to the N64, as I think your numbers are getting a little skewed, right, by the number of games in the library. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, Saturn doesn't I have mean, that I mean, also, you, I mean... Yeah, it's like 250, And a lot like of them five. are like these, these fancy Japanese RPGs. I mean, you, I mean, yeah, there, there are... We could argue what system has a better top 10. I think that would be, like, we should do an episode on that. Like, even though, uh, like... Gameplay and value wise, like we can talk about the value, but like which system, the top ten, like which system has the best top ten? We can have a little battle, and we can. Yeah, what's that publisher that I'm blanking on with the uh, the hot pink logo on working fucking Saturn? Working designs. Yeah, thank you. There's a ton of working designs on Saturn. Yep, I mean there are some on Sega CD too, but like your your top end games there are like Daytona, Panzer, Magic Knight, Burning Rangers, Bomberman, House of the Dead, Mega Man, Shining Force. Yeah, and like you got. There's some good games. Anyways, uh, there's 58 of them, though. And, like, remember, there are not that many games on the Saturn. So 58 yeah, of them, though, are above this uh, 86, are above the $96 retail value, right? 
The average cost is $247. Again, we're not talking about loose stuff because that's silly. But yeah, Saturn, you know, it, it's got a top end, but it it's one of those systems too. It's like Genesis. The top end, there's no like huge spike. There are expensive games and they seem expensive relative to the system. But when you look at it compared to other systems, when your top game is only like, and like Daytona USA should probably be like a lot more than like $1,500 to $2,000, right? Like as a, a weird mail away game, like your Panzer Dragons, $1,000. Again, go look at your little Samsons. Go look at your peaks. Even Super Nintendo has like stupid entertainment game is $2,500. And this doesn't even hit that peak. Does it so, not? What does so I know we're going based on on dumbass game value now data, but it says that Daytona is thirteen hundred dollars. That seems yeah okay. Low. The last sale it tracked was from twenty seventeen, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, well, but like to be fair, that game doesn't f- sell. Like it, it yeah, it, you know. Well, and it. even it, but see, like that's a game you could say it doesn't count. Unlike Extertainment, right? Like, or if even if you took that off, you took the other competitions. Like Panzer Dragon is only a thousand dollars, right? Like maybe maybe fourteen hundred dollars, like give or take a hundred here or there. Like the, uh, what I'm saying is the top isn't that high relative to the other super expensive video games, the top of other systems. Uh, you know, these ones are kind of lower. And as we get into newer systems, you'll see even, even less. And Sega Saturn used to be the expensive system. You know, it was one of the most what? expensive systems you could collect for. But right, now it was that get, way for a while too. It yeah. Was like, so it got now expensive we, and then sat there. Yeah, so it, like these games have just had people. Oh my god, the average Saturn game is less than N sixty four right now. <laughs> That's what, which is crazy. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. I'm. I know you're like saying that. It's like, man, Saturn's garbage. Yeah, well, we could. We'll have a talk about it one day. There Anyways, it is. so that's your Sega Saturn, and now Tyler can talk about his favorite system, the Dreamcast. Oh man, maybe I'll buy some Dreamcast games one day. All right, so you're fifty five dollars in nineteen ninety eight. Literally, Dreamcast came out nine nine ninety nine. Johnny, I could tell you the exact release date, so it did not come out in nineteen ninety eight. Must uh, have been the Japanese release. It sounds like we got a Japanese release date in here, Johnny. Damn it, Johnny. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. I see nineteen ninety nine. Fifty five dollars in nineteen ninety nine is now eighty seven dollars in real money, and the average cost of a complete in box Dreamcast game. I'm going to guess that's not supposed to say $281. Yeah, that can't be right. Oh, whoops. Let me. Sorry, guys. Is there an extra uh, Is there an extra one in there? Or is there an extra two in there? If there's an extra two, I will be very shocked. Hold on. Hold on. I'm doing it. I guess it's 20. Average is uh, $39. Uh, $40. Right. $40 is the average. Sorry, I don't and know the what the average are. cost of a complete box Dreamcast game is forty dollars, which seems crazy to me. But you know what? People like the Dreamcast. There are thirty complete in box games that cost more than eighty seven dollars. The average price of those games is a hundred and forty two dollars. That's another big percentage. Uh, again, how many Dreamcast, Dreamcast games are, are there? Like a hundred and something. Yeah. No, there's uh, more than a hundred. I mean, that's a pretty. That percentage is pretty in line. Actually, a lot of these percentages are in line with like about a fifth, I think, of their console libraries. I think Genesis has a very low number of very expensive games, and N64 Dreamcast is a high has number. almost three hundred games. It's like two hundred and eighty or something. Really? Am I crazy? Yeah, it's like two seventy eight or something. Right. All right. I believe you. <clears throat> of course, all these lists that say, "Oh, every Dreamcast game ever," doesn't actually tell you how many are f-ing on the list. Have fun counting. 280 sounds... I'm just going to my list, and I'm going to tell you how many are in my list. I, I, 280 sounds too high, Johnny. What do you Listchallenges.com, which is random, uh, it, sa- it says 257? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, f- no. D- depends what you're counting. My, I, I don't know. It, it's not, it, I'm saying it's around that number. Like I, I, I didn't do a count. I'm just looking at my spreadsheet, and it's like below 250. So it goes off the sheet. Who cares? All right. Okay. Yeah, I've got 254 in my list. And okay. I, I don't 254. Really list, so. Of the 254, 30, the important numbers, 30 are above that retail threshold. Like, we don't really ca- care about the tail because it doesn't really matter. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, it could be just that we're getting into more, uh, more modern systems. So True. fewer games are going to be quote unquote collectible. 
Well, and the inflation isn't as high, right? So, like, yeah. instead of in the Nintendo era where your inflation was 146%, you're coming down to inflation rates in 1999, where it's only 59% more, and they'll continue to fall. You get to 2003, it'll be 44%. 2008, it's 23%. Like, in, like infla- we start to catch up to the market. Yeah. So, oh, right, you know, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So. All right, continue. No, that's all I got to say about Dreamcast. I think it's the least interesting one here. And... <laughs> Stefan gets a real banger now. He's been mad about it, but here he goes. Xbox guy himself. Stefan, tell us about the Xbox. I am fond of the Xbox. Uh, released in 2001, when your average cost of your, or the, uh, your, your price for your $55 would be around $80, $79. Average value of CIB, $13. That actually makes sense in my head. Uh, how many above the CIB? 11 <laughs> Yeah, Xbox, it. do it. You go at your own pace. Yeah, yeah. Xbox, you're a banger. Don't let well, anyone tell that you seems, different. The, Xbox is one of those consoles, too, where it's like there's a huge delta between like the valuable ones and everything else. Um, yeah, well, I like, mean, it's just like there's a lot of $50 games, but yeah. not a lot of $90 and $100 games. Yeah. So, yeah, as the, the, 80, the, sorry, the $79 threshold, there are 11 games that are more than $79. Um, and the average CIB cost is $131. Uh, yeah, of those games. Of and, those and games. Like, yeah, so like, you're looking at like Fatal Frame 2 doesn't make it in there. Def Jam for New York, uh, you know, X probably gave them a bump of, uh, he's given it to them. A did bump de- of, like, did X indeed did give it to them? Yeah, he, he's, like they didn't make the cut, but I'm sure Def Jam Fight for New York is now over eighty dollars even though here it's like listed just below so like you like there's some things but the games like the top games there like outrun teen titans futurama obscure marvel versus capcom spike out battle street i don't even know what that is honestly uh stubs the zombie jurassic Park battle street is above eighty dollars yeah that's what they're saying 93 And like and and this has like a bit of bit bad data in it on my part yeah. because I trusted Game Value now to get this right, but they left Driver Parallel Lines Limited Edition in this in the retail set, yeah. uh, in in the standard set, even though that wouldn't be counted in the standard set, which is by far I mean, what, is by uh, far they, the rarest. They, most they can't be the arbiter of what counts. I mean, I know they they no, try to be they, with a little they exclusions. Have a bra- they have a button. They have a button that says standard. Like they have a a sort on it that puts it there yeah. i'm just saying if you put anything in a f-ing bracket if you put hard brackets around <laughs> it you probably didn't include it in the regular set also right. tyler they 100 percent try to be the arbiter of what counts i mean they not. try to be but like they literally have a f-ing filter for it there are games that like now are only released as as special like limited run games editions so i no, all of those come with standard editions too. Mm. This I got a bracket that says it's a limited edition. Like, just have a check. Have a basic data validation. If it's got a bracket, None of their exclude data it. Sucks if, it's got, <laughs> if it says limited, exclude it. This is not hard. Okay. Maybe they. Back. Maybe it's, the the guy who runs Johnny, you need to include them. all limited editions. Johnny, is Carly home right now? I just want to make sure there's a nurse on hand. Just in case. She's not she's not home. <laughs> but if I have a coronary and I die, <laughs> it'll be because the data is so poor. Also, yeah, it's like guys, people are like, why is he so worked up about this? I can hear you out there. Like, <laughs> settle down, dummy. I don't understand. Like, yeah, I, I I get that in your world, this doesn't matter. But I am a data analyst. I deal with this bullshit and fight this bullshit every day i am like some weird knight in olden times fighting the dragon that is bad data and losing every single day so like when i just see it like my like i don't need this to pop up in my hobby for my data to be this bad just like do better it's like it's like why we do this show and like part of the reason like we try to bring data to people we try to talk about people we try to have good informed discussions so people don't make like weird willy-nilly decisions i do this as a job, so sometimes my technical, uh, you know, mind on this interferes with my ability to be reasonable on a podcast and talk about it. Also, that's not As why Tyler's never... here. Tyler is here to call people poor. Tyler's here to call people poor, and I'm here to look at them. <laughs> I mean, only if they're buying loose cartridges with a manual of uh, a magical chase. 
What are you doing, yeah, Johnny? I, I like how Tyler's trying to bait barometer me again. of Johnny, poor I'm people. Not gonna, I'm not going to take it. Yeah, like here, let's let's check this out. Tyler's barometer for poor people are anyone who can count themselves as someone who might purchase a magical chase <laughs> of any variety. You sound so stupid. You're so stupid. Yeah, his poor people are spending $8,000 on a game instead of $15,000. 100%. They could be saving yep. $8,000 and just buying a pinball machine and not uh, not worrying about turbo graphics. Could they buy a pinball machine? Who knows now with these inflation? God, like, who knows? I'm desperately trying to, like, cast off the fat cat mantle and throw it on Tyler. No. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll I'm going to throw it right back at you later in this episode, Stefan. Don't worry. We'll have to we'll have to change your jingle. That. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. uh, I think that's all I want to say about Xbox, aside from the fact that Xbox is f-ing awesome and it's a system you should collect because uh, it's awesome. It it is a historically relevant system. Like it, it's an interesting. It came out at an interesting time. Like, and it's still here. The fuck I, you guys I imagine weird about too. Collect PS2. <laughs> Being able to get a being able to get a game that comes with a little f-ing vest is great. Yeah, you know where that all, you could also get that if you collected the full PS2 set, Stefan. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I love that. I love that I get to continually stick that in your craw of like something that you never made in 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 a, in a time when you know that like almost everything that you have recommended to me <laughs> up to a certain point I just bought blindly, uh. knowing that I never. I never bent, and I well, never. Well, you would have sold uh, it, so it it it's, it's less special. It would be gone now. It would have been gone, been gone now. But that means it's just a great time to start anew. You've you've burned what's there, and now you have all the shelf space. That's right. I do have to start over. <laughs> if anybody needs any shelves, <laughs> uh, Stephen, yeah, too bad. I, I know you keep them. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's uh, start over because now, like any, like I can't believe you're still dicking around with Atl- Atlantic Oscars. If it's not custom, what are you doing, fat cat? That's true. I know. I mean, like, he does. He only has what five mahogany, World of Nintendo what... cabinets. I think we could do better than that. How much did an average KB Toys have? And not five. Yeah, probably like three. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, Stefan. The KB Toy stores have collecting uh, a cool right. mantle. So um. All right. Let's. let's Let's get back on track here. Uh, yeah. I know you guys came to the show for data, but stay for the petty barbs. Um, that's I, don't why think we're here. I think they're getting data. I don't know that they came here for that. No. Uh, <laughs> well, did they come for the petty barbs then? I don't know if my statement works the other way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Come for the petty barbs. Stay for the data. Data? Stay for the data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> PS1, uh, 1995. Woo. Banger of a system. I, I'm not even kidding. Uh, 1996. Game changing system. $96 is the average cost uh, of a game now. So your $55 becomes $96. Woo! Jeez. It's, uh, you know, that's a. Uh, I'd are like to point out. Games. Oh, no, that's. Wait, did you just say that wrong? You're talking about the inflation cost and you said the average cost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah oh, I did. I'm sorry. Okay. The inflation cost is $96. The average cost is $26. So that seems so not, high to me. I, not really. Like if you no look no no at no, t- but, but I I don't I don't doubt that it's true. But like it's just in my head. It just seems there are so many so many games for that console, and like in my head, like I guess I'm just thinking in my head back to like so PS One is like one of the consoles that when like Johnny was putting it together, I was like hitting the streets with him, and like we were sort of like we're, like I was working on Xbox at the time, and he's working on PS One, so like I I saw like the the big like bulk deals and i saw all these like cheap 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 uh cib games and so i was just I, in my head having seen you put that set together for definitely below this average cost um it, it's 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 a difficult hurdle for me to get over yeah i mean and i did it and i like well i and i've been doing it for a while though so like what you missed out on is i already had a lot of the good stuff because like a lot of the good stuff on PlayStation is the stuff that's collectible. So you're not like, you don't, I mean, you do have some like weird trash games, but like your top games, you know, you're like your Kelowna's and like Clonoa. your NFL Blitz, Klonoa, yeah, uh, Val- Valkyrie Profile, your Sukadin 2's, Tales, Concerto, uh, Persona 2, Coldelka, right? Like these, these are games that were like already kind of in the know and people liked. Um, like your Lunars, like the, there was not too much like weird chaff games that were at the top. So I was already kind of trying to buy the top games. So 
when you saw it, I was like buying the middle and the bulk stuff that like hasn't been fully fleshed out yet. Um, but it's crazy to me. And, and when you guys hear this number that only 73 games are above the $96 threshold. And that seems, that seems crazy. And you got to remember there, there are so many PlayStation games. This is a very small percentage of the library, right? Like, yeah, that's definitely, is, that's less than a 10th. That's the lowest percentage of anything. I mean, well, Xbox, I mean, that doesn't really count, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it it's crazy. I mean, it's not very many. And the, again, the top games are just not that expensive. Like and a lot of the top games now, the most expensive ones are like dumb jewel case variants. Like who cares? Yeah. Who cares yeah, about yeah, a Mortal yeah. Kombat three jewel case variant? Um, you can get the long box, the first print. Like who cares about the siphon filter? You know, nine eleven. They're gonna say that's four hundred dollars. No one's asking. Like everyone wants like five hundred to a thousand for that. And like I just don't know how many of that people care. Like, but your Tron bonds and uh, you know your your clock towers, they're like you know two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. Tails concerto is three hundred dollars, but it was like two hundred for a long time. Like, there's just nothing that's over a thousand dollars, and like every system, ha- and you'd expect like PlayStation is early enough, you'd expect that it had a game over a thousand dollars, like one crazy one or something, and there isn't like a retail game that that reached that peak. So there's not like they're like half of that, even which is crazy. I and mean, that- it doesn't have cardboard boxes, but then the flip side of that is that like there's a thousand games. How is there not one that became the stadium events yeah. of PlayStation? And there there's yeah. isn't like what's the closest like team buddies I know is one that's rare, but like it's not it's not even the most expensive game anymore. Anywhere like, near like, like <laughs> any uh of the weird cardboard rare stuff. No, and and that's what I said, like a lot of the known stuff is what people are really like team buddies it costs less than Tales of Destiny or JoJo's <laughs> Bizarre Adventure. <laughs> okay. You know? Like that's that's what I'm saying. Like weird games like Fox Hunt, like maybe that w- should be in there. Like Batman, the arc forever, the arcade games, like a weird expensive one, like, uh, adventures of Lomax. That was always one of the like weird yeah. ones that I was like, man, that game's always been $150. It still is though. And it, it has been like 15 years. It's, it's crazy that adventures of Lomax didn't shoot up greater than this. So nothing, nothing really didn't like suck it in two $300. There was a point where that thing dropped below a hundred and it was at like 200 and the like early 2000s took a drop went back up and now i mean even with all the spike and being a sukadin game like one of the best rpgs uh you know it's still not not there it's it's weird that playstation never got that that bump i'm sure it'll happen one day um and playstation did like a lot of these values went up quite a bit because i finished the set in uh march february end of february march of 2020 and then coronavirus hit and everything i just bought like doubled because i bought all those dumb games in the middle so just imagine that this average price was like from the middle which in playstation terms is a wide swath it's like 800 games or whatever all just like doubled in cost so playstation's a weird system yeah i mean there are people who say like PlayStation will be the future Nintendo going forward because people think PlayStation systems. I mean, like obviously Xbox, uh, Microsoft not putting out like the highest quality God of War, Spider-Man's as many as uncharted, like Sony is on PlayStation. So they think that, uh, that's going to be a thing going forward, but I don't know. Well, well think about PlayStation's place in history, right? Like what was the, like, Nintendo was amazing, right? Like, that's the the thing that changed everything. Super Nintendo is great, but I don't think it gets the historical impact that, say, NES does. You take uh, that back. I, look, <laughs> you know no one loves it more than me, Stefan, but, like, what what's next? PS1 has, like, if we're talking about five most important systems, right, PlayStation's going to be in that top five, right? Yep, do, do, you, do you put it outside of the top five? I wouldn't. I don't no, see how I you could. Be. So... <clears throat> It's in, it's crazy to me that it hasn't seen a bigger deal, especially for where it landed in history and and it dethroned Nintendo and came out of I won't say nowhere because Sega and, and Nintendo built it themselves. Uh, you know <laughs> the, the thing that killed them, which is the best. It's 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 so good that Nintendo and Sega both screwed Sony and but then gave them enough knowledge for Sony to just stab them right in the heart and uh, take the crown from them. So that's kind of awesome. 
Anyways, PlayStation, I think, still criminally underpriced. I feel like what makes Nintendo the thing, uh, I mean, besides the fact Mario. that it's like older. Yeah, like Mario's the thing. Yeah. They don't have a thing. Like when you think PlayStation, you think Crash Spyro. Crash Bandicoot. Uh, and Solid Snake, who's like a multi-platform character now. Like they, they don't have that thing that carried through the entire PlayStation brand. Like now it's Miles Morales and the Kratos. Crash and Spyro are also now multi-platform, so. <laughs> oh, sure. I didn't even think of that. Like, <laughs> yeah. They suck at having mascots in an era where mascots were everything. I don't know how that's even possible. I mean, they had Crash as their mascot for a while. It just, like, and it did well for them. It just didn't last, right? They yeah, just they really did. Al- ma- they allowed third party to, like, pick their mascots for them. Like, I mean, arguably, Laura Croft was a mascot for a while, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. even though she didn't originate there. like, But you would think that, like, she could have been the face of the franchise, even though we know uh, from Wonder Woman's example <laughs> that they don't want to make women in video games. Um uh, yeah, it, they just didn't have the thing that stuck that they just kept making. Like, it, like Crash wasn't their thing. Like, Sony doesn't have the one thing that they're just like, this is our best thing. We're going to make it over and over ad infinitum like a Mario game yeah. or a Zelda game. I feel like uh, you could look at Super Smash Brothers and it's like just A-list character after A-list character. And then you go to PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale and it's like, huh. I guess these are all the, the PlayStation guys, huh? Cool, cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Like, yeah. Like, it's weird that these, some of these characters are there. Why aren't they on Smash Brothers, though? Like, that's <laughs> like, what I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these characters are great. They should be in Smash. Yeah. I'm like, why isn't... Or, or what was the other one? Um, Like, the Capcom one they did? I'm like, that's cool. But, like, shouldn't some of these guys... Like, why don't you just get those guys over on, on Smash Brothers? A game people are going to play. Um. And they're going to keep making. I said the purest in me, though, still wishes that it was only like OG originated Nintendo characters. Mm, yeah, it, it's weird seeing non Nintendo characters in Smash. But then again, I don't play Smash, so I don't care. Not, <laughs> not anymore. Anyways, we have I did one gra- more system. I, we're gonna talk I about. did greatly enjoy the Sephiroth trailer, though, when they announced him, where they see it, you see the silhouette of him skewering Mario, and then it just turns out that he just hooked his overalls it was good good stuff good stuff playstation 2 uh the console stefan's currently collecting for came out in 2000 and 55 dollars in 2000 is now worth 79 dollars we say worth does that work yes okay uh complete in box average playstation 2 game is 17 dollars how many complete in box games are above 79 dollars 68 out of uh, 45,000 PlayStation 2 games. Yeah, I was going to say, which is an incredibly <laughs> small sliver. And again, we're getting into the modern, more modern stuff here. And then the average game of those 68, uh, the average price of those 68 games is $152. That is still a lot of expensive PS2 games. That's uh, actually, that's in line with PlayStation, which is kind of crazy. That's like the yeah, same just- amount. <laughs> And just know that, like, because we're on game value now, and maybe their data isn't, like, up on the current spike, there's so many games that are, like, right around this that if they just got a $20 bump or a $10 bump, which is very easy to do in the current climate, that they would climb over this value marker. So, sure. Like, well, a lot of games could, like, leap over it. But I was pretty we, strict on where I kept that value marker. We have certainly said it many, many times on the show that generally it's not the top end when you're collecting for a set. It's not the top end that kills you. It's the middle. The It's like, yeah, okay, there is X amount of games over $100, but here's a f- load of $75 games that are going to punch you in the face. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, it's crazy. In some systems, like where Turbo, oh, there's a lot of top end, but like the Magical Chase really does punch you in the face, and, and the stadium events really punches you in the face. But like we're talking about these more modern systems... Nah, not really. Like you, you can get it, and like, but also, what's the top could drift down to a tenth place title uh, with you know one big push from somebody on YouTube. Saturn, Saturn, and Super Nintendo. When I was putting those sets together, the the middle was so crushing. Yeah, Super cr- Nintendo yeah. was so bad. Just when, there's so many games. When I was putting together Saturn, I was like, okay, I'm like, I'm only like, a, like I think I sold the set. When I sold the set, I think I was missing like 60 games. I was like, all right, I'm getting really close. And then I look at the number, I'm like, oh, that's eight thousand yeah. dollars. It's crazy what that looks like. Anyways, um, do we have more to say on this? 
Nope. No? Okay. I think the most surprising thing is that Super Nintendo has more complete in box games that are more expensive than their average inflation adjusted cost than NES does. Well, I think what blew my f***ing mind today is the 83 CIBs above the threshold for N64. That's also crazy. Uh, Well, that and then that Saturn didn't hit that rise, right? That it sunk below N64. Yeah. Like, it sunk below GameCube. Like, not only did it sink below N64, it sunk below GameCube, guys. Think about that for a second. Saturn, easier and cheaper to collect for than GameCube. Gross. Gross, Uh, gross, gross. You're all gross. So I'm just going to say that our conclusion is that if you're not Nintendo, you are garbage. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) Especially adjusting for inflation. And, uh, well, I mean, it's it's been known forever. Nintendo games don't lose value, except for that weird time where they did lose value, where, like, you know, the early 2000s through 2012, maybe. That one time in history where you could get a Mario Kart 64 for $15. Remember when? Remember when? Remember when? Hello, darkness, my old friend. So I do want to talk about that, Johnny. (laughs) Um, Okay. Tell, tell me about this. Uh, or do I, did I rant enough about the data? Did I tell you guys how bad the data is? Did did I did I explain like if you guys just want to go look and you just see what I'm talking about? Okay, here's a thing you can do. You can take any system, right? Like take a disk based system, like Xbox or something, and take the two columns, just copy and paste them right out of Game Value now. And do a simple formula, right? You'll have the complete in box. Well, you'll have the loose one, which is still gross. And then you'll have the complete in box value one. And then uh, in your column over, just put equals loose price minus complete price. And you'll see if that number isn't, an, you know, if it's not negative. Like if, if the loose game is somehow more expensive than the complete game, you know you have a problem. It's a super easy check. You can put a data validation step on that very easily with a simple formula. So when you get to the bottom and you got like 40 games where the loose game is more expensive, you got to think, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe this data isn't good. Maybe something about this, the way this is updating is poor. Like you could even write a script that says, you know, if loose is ever greater than complete, then flag or, you know, red or make CIB price at least the loose price because it should never, ever be less. Like, it's just, especially on a disc game, it's not going to happen. It's not a thing. It's easy to understand this. I don't, and the, the, like, also, this is not my website. Uh, this isn't something I make money off of. This isn't something I'm trying to sell to people or get people to subscribe to because if I was, I would surely be doing a better fucking job than that. But that's me. That's me. So, you know, just a guy who wants to go look and, you know, it's not like I found this data and all these bad holes through hours and hours of searching or plumbing through their code. Yeah, these were cursory glances and being like a person with eyeballs. Uh, you know, it's just that. Just that. So, f- game value now. It's <laughs> price charting. They all suck. Your data sucks. You're doing a bad job. I think Code Monkey on Video Game Sage is making a new price tracking website and a new variant website. Am I thinking correctly? Uh, yeah. But it might only be for NES games because that guy likes NES. But I don't know. We'll see what the future holds, Johnny. Tyler, you had something you wanted to talk about? I wanted to no say so. We're basically looking at a bunch of old systems, and they went through this period called, you know. 10 years after a console comes out, it becomes garbage and all the games. Uh, and what cost is that nothing. called, Tyler? No, 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 I'm not talking about the drop of no value. I'm uh. talking about how, you know, I there was a time in 2005 like- I could go and I could pick up as many Mario Kart 64s and Super Mario 64s for $20. And a cartridge of GoldenEye was like six bucks. And right, when things are old, but not nostalgic. Yes. We are talking about basically how many of these games have increased in price past the point where they were originally purchased for after inflation. Uh, you go look at the game value now, uh, Switch, just go sort Switch by highest price. And again, a lot of these are like stupid limited editions because we're in the modern era. There are tons of games that already cost more than MSRP. People are like... They're like, we're trying to yeah. jump the gun so far in collecting that everyone is essentially speculating that like, oh my God, 
uh, Fury on the limited. I don't know if that's a, what limited thing that is, but Fury is a seventy-one dollar game. I guarantee that was not seventy-one dollars new. Oxen Free is a sixty-eight dollar game. Such uh, a good game, though. What's up? I said it's such a good game. It's a good game. Uh, Night Trap is ninety one dollars. Like Snake Wait, Pass Trap is one hundred forty dollars. More expensive than than the Sega CD one. That's a yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. It's just so. I can't predict the future, but and, and like I feel like I know we're caught in like this this mania, this euphoria in games right now. It sure feels like games won't be as garbagey as they were in the past. I don't think I am going to, there's not going to be a period where I go and I find a super Mario Odyssey for $15. It totally could be that. Uh, but it feels like people are that, that, pre, that, I, I don't know what to say, pre collecting games, seeing the value in games out. before they've actually become bona fide collectibles. Well, they're that worked really well in the nineties for comics, right? Yeah, they're just cutting out the cycle, right? Well, you you said there yes. was a cycle. It's like games, retail, and then they they dip, 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 and then the new system comes out, and you get this like period of a like right as the new system is coming out when games are at their bottom, and then like for a few years after, and then not to like a like after like the life cycle of the next console did those games like really start to see their value rise, but that that part is gone. People just said nope, games are valuable. It's like the whole that whole process has been like short circuited. It's uh, yeah. I, I say it a lot. It's hard to overstate in like 2005 how much N64 was garbage. And here we are. The switch is like a modern console. And I go on Instagram and f- people own like 800 switch games. Like people have crazy switch collections. Um, I don't remember a time like in. I keep going back to 2005 just because that's when I started collecting. I wouldn't have logged on to a collecting forum and someone's like, yo, what's up? Uh, I've got 500 Xbox 360 games. Yeah, and you know, let's say like 2007, 2008, when that would have actually been feasible. But, uh, you know, there, there aren't people that collected Xbox 360. I mean, I'm sure there's a few. There weren't people like multiple people collecting every Xbox 360 game. And now there are threads of people that keep on top of Switch releases to make sure they get every single release as they come out. And it's it's nuts to me how how different and short circuited the cycle is. I mean, back in two thousand five, Tyler, I almost threw away my Tarzan big box for the N sixty four because yeah. I was like, "What am I even doing with this thing? I, it's hard to store. It doesn't fit with my other boxes. What even is this?" Yeah, and so during that period of garbage, what I wanted to talk about is the trough of no value. So while no one was th- is thinking about these systems as they like languish in no one cares about PlayStation one, like that kind of everyone thinks it's garbage era. That's where like things get lost and your team buddies emerge as like the, Oh my God, guys, there's, there's no team buddies out there. We need to, we need to start buying up all the team buddies. And I feel like in this short circuiting process, people are trying to guess what will be the cool thing in 30 years. Uh, people are buying like, I see my friends, they're buying sealed Super Mario 3D All-Stars and they're buying like a copy of Pokemon Snap to play and a copy to keep sealed. And I'm like, you're you're trying to guess in 30 years what will be the collectible thing. And guys, it's not in 30 years. If it's you are guessing right years. now, you are wrong. There's there is <laughs> no no one in history has guessed in 30 years what the collectible thing will be. If you guessed what the most collectible NES game like would be 30 years ago, zero people would say, oh yeah, Super Mario Brothers 3, there's gonna be a copy of that that sells for $156,000. Like, no one would say that. It, it. But but that's what people are saying. You just said that no one would guess Super Mario 3, but people are guessing on Super Mar- the Super Mario All-Star Collection, which is the Super Mario 3 of its time. No, it is not. <laughs> yes, it, I mean, yes, it, as far as like sales... Wrong. No, what? That, uh, no, it, like as far as being common and everywhere and like everyone can get it like, yeah, so that's Super Mario three. It's the most common Nintendo game ever. And then you've got this all star game, which even though it had a limited print, it limited, I say limited and like there's it's probably like the more of the 11th best than, selling game on the switch. It's like it sold more than every single Wii U game except Mario Kart. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It's like, but you said no one would guess that for super mario 3 but they got it right it's i'm just saying your comparison's a little weak there 
What are you talking about? Uh, Super, yeah, Mar- Tyler. Super Mario 3 because- is like the most beloved NES game. And this yes, is a poor collection about, that people you're saying, like. No, you, you said no one would have guessed Super Mario 3 would sell for $150,000 because it was a common game and very beloved. And that, But you also said people are buying Mario All-Star and they're wrong because it's a common game and beloved. It's not beloved. It's like everyone's like, oh, wow, it's a poor collection. They didn't do anything to it. And it's just up a bit. Not, not everyone shits on ports the way you do. People just like their yeah, Mario. Tyler. What? Go, go look at sh- games media I, sh- I guarantee every article of this is like wow it's really disappointing they didn't do anything to the graphics i really wish nintendo could have uh, tweaked the yeah, a little yeah, bit but those people aren't the real game people they, they aren't the people playing the game like they also shit all over mario all-star back in the day on super nintendo they would have been like look at what they did to this thing oh my god the frame like the fuzzy posters this looks like garbage why are we doing this they they would have been all shitting on that too all right like, what are you i'm trying sorry to make? Uh, guys, it's invest like in Super Mario like All Stars. It's the next Super Mario Brothers three. I've decided no, that Yeah, I'm Tyler saying, is my catchphrase of twenty twenty one. Yeah, it's not. I'm not saying it, it is. There's not. It's not going to be collectible. I'm just saying that's a a weak comparison because Super Mario three did become collectible and it is very common. But the reason right? I'm not saying that the the commonness has to do with it is how many people are saving them in mint condition. People, oh, yeah. well, no I mean, one, no one predicted that Super Mario Three would be this thing that must be saved in mint condition. No, no, that no one did that. With and any there was Nintendo a point games. where That's it was literally started... the most expensive game ever sold. Yeah, and the yeah, reason we... that happened is it went through the trough of no value because no one had those sealed. I mean, obviously, there's True. a bunch of sealed copies of that out there, but uh, yeah, well, new old stuff. The demand stuff. for but, that um, greatly exceeds the supply right now. I mean, we talked about that right in the beginning of the show with our beginning of talking about the actual topic of the show that the Nintendo, like people, you just didn't keep games. Like you weren't sitting on them. No one did that. You bought your games and you played them and that was what they were for. Um, They weren't like the only reason one would come up that would still sealed or anything that makes them rare and weird now is that they got lost somewhere in time and then have just reemerged. It's so, not. It's not like that now. Like now, people are trying to make a market of all of uh, the new Mario All Star port, uh, and it, that's just not going to happen. That that is wrong. You you're never you're not getting your money out of that. So because it is so impossible to predict, like I like oh my god, how many people are going to buy Breath of the Wild like two copies? Like they're going to be like oh my god, Zelda. That's one of the big franchises. Got to have one of those sealed for the future. Um. That stuff I know is n- it's never going to be like crazy in price just because of all the speculation on unsealed stuff like the modern stuff. A lot of people are keeping that. What is going to be the expensive Switch game in the future? Right now, the most expensive Switch game is Shantae Collector's Edition, Shantae and the Pirate's Curse uh, Collector's Edition, which like goes for almost a thousand dollars. And like I don't know, but I think everyone is going to be wrong on what is collectible. And sure, and, and like and now. Modern collecting is a nightmare. You know, Switch games are getting limited prints just because the lack of physical media. People are buying less physical media. Uh, You have all these little companies that are just like making one-off prints. The lack of region locking on the Switch. It's going to be a nightmare to collect for the Switch or predict what's going to be rare. It's probably not going to be a limited run a uh, special edition that they made 5,000 or 10,000. Well, I mean, uh, Shantae, how, how rare is Shantae? I mean, I feel like, like it could just be Shantae. Like it could be like, okay, this was one of the limited run games, but it's a game that everybody likes. Uh, so this is going to be the expensive game on the switch forever. I mean, it'll probably be some game that like people like we got to get further in time where people are talking about like when the switch is dead and gone, which will not, not really ever happen. Um, but there's gotta be like the videos of like, Oh, did you never find this one? Like that we're missing that cycle. I don't know how we get there. Like in this new, this new wave of it's, it's going to be everything. like the most obscure variant that like only Josh Byerly knows about. And then 20 years from now, he'll be an old man and he'll drop like, Oh, you guys missed this product code. The second digit changes from a one to a two. That's worth $7,000 now. Yeah. Shout out to like, Josh oh, Byerly. Well, What's up, eh? <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, it's like, you, you don't know. You, oh, you missed it? Yeah, that's not the first print of it. Here's the real first print of Mario Odyssey. Came in a blue box. That Johnny, do you, small do you want me to go off on first prints? The most expensive game on the Switch is Shantae and the Pirate's Curse. A f***ing 3DS game that was ported to Wii U and then has now been ported again to Switch. That's a yeah, $1,000 game? Guys, guys, come on. 
Anyways. Is it the first Shantae game? Because then it's it, that was given. No, the first Shantae is on the, on the Game Boy Color, and is I'm guessing probably, this is, the, is this the one that and, comes with a fake uh, Shantae? Cartridge? Yeah, it's the one that comes with the okay. fake Shantae. Oh wait, that uh, was comes, like an open pre-order, wasn't it? Yeah, they are all open you. pre-orders. I don't know. No, if this one was twenty. Though. Oh my god, this is the one that came with a fake cartridge. Damn. I literally, I didn't buy this because I'm like, God, everyone's going to f***ing buy this. Who the f*** wants this thing? And now it's the most expensive Switch game. <laughs> Good job, well, Tyler. Well, you know what? I don't play video games like the stock market. I still see it as a, a dumbass port with a fake Game Boy Color cartridge. So, so my opinion I, on it has not changed. Yeah. Like, let me, let me put it into perspective for you. Like, it's $1,000, right? Uh, if you want to spend an additional thousand dollars and that's only in today's money, um, you can buy, uh, the actual Game Boy Shantae, the, you know, the true first print, like the game that you should care about to hunt uh, Game Boy Color. I mean, if I was going to buy any Shantae game, that's the only one I would buy. Cause I'm not a Shantae fan though. So well, there's so. a way forward for you, Tyler. Ooh. Uh, hey, did it. All right. Anyways, what else do you got to say about the trough of no value? I agree, no, though. It's, it's like people are skipping the when, is how what happens when people don't put anything in the trough, Tyler? Well, something's going to be in the trough, right? I mean, it is every there's how many switches are 100 million switches out there. I, I have no idea. Uh, I mean, it could it just be that games are so mass produced that nothing is rare anymore, Johnny? I don't know. I have no idea. We, and then at the same time, I say that, but like I see card only switch games. I'm like, guys, what happened? These are thin cases. They're so easy to store. What are you stupid kids are throwing out this packaging? And also there's no manuals anymore. There's nothing to lose. You don't have to worry about inserts. Is switch collecting yeah, going to be just super easy in the future? Unless it's limited run games, in which case it's a nightmare. I, Tyler, I don't know. I don't know. It's, I don't know. Jamie. I, let's like, come back I to this in 30 years. Let's, let's see how switch turned out. What are we talking out. about right now? I don't, I have no <laughs> idea. I don't know what we're talking right. about. Tyler's just talking about how we're like, what's going to happen with Switch, guys? I don't know. And then Switch yeah, 2 is going to come out. No one's going to care about Switch anymore. You want to feel really bad? Just know that you missed out on that Chante like box set, which was like a fake box they just printed so you could throw your three Chante games in from Limited Run. That, you know, is now yeah. over like a couple hundred dollars. What did they just sell a box? Yep, they sold a box for you to put your Chante games in. Uh Man, they those limited run games guys, they've got it figured out. <laughs> here's a here's a hot tip for the people at home. You can tell when I don't know what we're talking about, when I stop talking and these two are just going back and forth, and then every like five minutes I go, Yeah, Tyler, that oh. is that's that's how you know I don't know what we're talking about. I mean, it's it's in the episode, Doc. <laughs> it's not our fault you're over there like pruning or preening in the mirror, like looking at yourself. Look, I am very busy telling Josh Byerly on Facebook that things are in his butt. Cool. Thank, thanks for really being a part of the show. Uh, way to dedicate yourself and uh, you know put yourself out there. Tyler, uh, are we done here? Can we move to the other part of the show? Let's move yeah. to the second half of the show, Johnny. All right, yeah, you said you it. got something to talk to me about, right, Tyler? That was something you wanted to talk about? I do want to talk to you, Stefan, because I do want to start putting uh, Q&A questions from our listening audience from the Patreon, pa patrons, okay. because we right. uh, we set up a patron uh, Discord channel to ask questions for the mailback episodes, and now people are asking more questions than we actually do mailback episodes for, so I think it would be easier to just take like three or five questions every episode, and then we can just have like some Q&A segment every episode. And talk okay, about some well, random stuff because you know we're always so on topic here. We might want to just talk about. So some does that mean stuff. I'm never going to get a Stefan episode ever again? That makes no, because then when we can we can do Q and A episodes where we ask you know the okay. the rest all of right, the listening right, audience. All right, all right, good, good, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're always getting a Stefan episode now. Nice. Every episode like is a Stefan episode. This was totally Woo. a Stefan episode, not a Johnny episode. <laughs> uh, Stefan, I think you had the the first question even. Uh, I did. Yeah, it's not even on this list. All right. The question was, uh, hey, I saw your notes about selling thousands of games at once, which is I, I did do that recently. Uh, so for, for clarity, 
Uh, I recently decided to kind of reinvest what I've put into the retail portion of my collection back into things like art and one of one stuff that everyone knows that I'm passionate about. So that's what I did. Uh, so the question was, would I be willing to discuss the logistics of such sales on the podcast, i.e. how to price? Um, and so, yes. Um, and as you might imagine, um, it really depends on how much you value your time. I've talked about this a lot. Johnny and I have both talked about this a lot, about uh, really, really valuing an hour of our time, which is why we're not out at yard sales, which is why we just kind of go to swap meets to see friends and game swap meets and stuff like that to see friends. We're not out there hunting, sifting through baby clothes because I value the in, an hour of my time so highly that if I'm not pulling sealed chrono triggers out of a pile of baby clothes every hour, it's not worth my time. So. Um, so yeah, the, if you if you do value your if you do value your time highly like me, uh, essentially if you want to sell lots of games, you kind of just have to be willing to take a bath a little bit. Um, not a t you know not really a lot, but generally when you are looking at selling thousands and thousands of games, the magic number is typically 30 uh, 30 percent. So if you're willing to take a thirty percent loss, it will be rather easy because that's generally around the price point that retailers are looking to buy in. Um, so that's exactly what I did. Essentially, I, I looked at I looked at uh, price charting, which again is not the uh, not not the greatest uh, metric, but it's the best we have. And I was I was comfortable with that number. So I took I basically sold in sets and I priced them out at 70 percent of whatever whatever the um, the uh, algorithms or not algorithm but the uh whatever the, the pr price charting or, or or game value now prices were and negotiated a little bit up or down from there so at that point if you're willing to sell in whole sets at 70 percent generally you'll have people who are willing to back a truck up to your house and give you a pile of money and take all of your games from you so, so i which Stephan, is exactly what happened Stefan, i, I want to just throw in though you're sure. saying it's seventy percent of the the value now, but you still made money on that sale. It's not like like you oh. probably saw over a thirty percent increase on everything you bought, right? Oh, absolutely. Especially I in was current in, times. I, that, I just want to like I, get that was, out there. Yeah, like it would be it would have been a bad deal if I had gotten into the game. I don't know, like a year ago, and was selling it now. But I've I've I I bought in at a, a long enough time now that I was so in the black on these games that that the 30 percent was still an incredible delta compared to what i compared to what i paid for them so yes i was absolutely way in the black so it made a you know it made even more sense for me to not want to uh to spend all the time that i i would have spent parting things out so i ended up being able to sell about six thousand games in under two weeks um which is a staggering, staggering uh, amount of, of of time, considering how long. Uh, conversely, I would be sitting there trying to. I mean, it would it would have taken me years if I wanted to get my yeah, hundred percent out of them. It. Be a full time job. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, but yeah, so I essentially was able to sell to. I think uh, those, all six thousand of those games went to like a grand total of like four four people, five people. So. Uh, but yeah, so if you're essentially it's, it's, if you are looking to sell at a, like a competitive full value price point, it's going to take you forever. If you're willing to take your 30% loss, you can, you can move thousands of games relatively quickly. Even Sega Pico. Pico. Yes. I sold that in one go. <laughs> People like the Pico. I, I, I like, They're I've had not even video offers. games, Johnny. They're books. Tyler, they you know Tyler, real. you know the Tyler, you know the system that was the only one that wouldn't sell. Uh, the Odyssey Two, the yep. Odyssey Two. <laughs> Nobody, guys. Atlantis is super two. hard to find. Someone pick up Stefan's Odyssey Two set. <laughs> so anyway, that kind of answers the question. I know it's it seems like it's not rocket science, and it's not. Like it's just it, you have to be willing to. Hopefully, you are in a position where you bought in a while ago, and you can take your thirty percent loss today and still make kind of make your money, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, you just kind of have to. If you want to sell quickly, you have to be willing to take that loss. Um, but you know, doing you know selling through six thousand games in under two weeks versus years of my life 
was well, like I didn't even think about it. It was it, no brainer. Absolutely. Best decision I ever made. All right. And uh, I'm just going to move on to the next question because I think Stefan answered that thoroughly enough. Yeah. Clearvis, I'm going through, I'm going to the oldest questions in the channel. So Clearvis asks, uh, what is the equivalent of having a cartridge only in comics or other collectible hobbies? Is a comic, is it a comic that's missing its cover, damaged cover? I don't think comics is a good, it's just, I, yeah. I don't think it's, yeah, that's not a good measuring point. I think most, even things that have an analog to video games, like toys, there's, because video games, they have, you have them new, brand new, you have them with the packaging, and then you have them in a state that you would use them, card only. Uh, so toys that kind of matches up, except that a lot of carded toys are just new. Uh, so there's way more, you know, new toys than there are new video games. Our video games... Toy, ve- toy vehicles where you can buy the box and like, yeah. then put the vehicle back in. But yeah, the figures themselves are usually like, it's either new and card or, you know, loose. I think but people who have saved their video game packaging are crazy people. Like who would, I don't, I don't understand. Like if you have like a record or a VHS, that's like where it lives. But because cartridges have end labels, like why would you bother to put it back in the box? I don't understand why there's any packaging for video games, honestly. And there's so much that people just did not have the same mindset as me. Yep. I, you know, the small nest boxes that they got over in like Europe, I wish those were our sizes. Could you imagine how much better all of our box shapes were would be in if we didn't have the wasted space of that stupid styrofoam? Yeah. Like so I I'll, just, just like, before we, before we move on from this question, I, I also really hate it when people use comics as an analog for games, uh, especially when we're talking about the sealed stuff. When people say like, "Oh, this is the action comic," f- you f- you and your action comics. Um, <laughs> oh, wow, I think you just said f- you, Dennis, but that's weird. So. Yes, <laughs> there's not the first time nor the last time. F- you, Dennis. Um, I uh, so uh, so I'm curious. Um, he doesn't listen to the show. <laughs> um, you, Dennis. <laughs> wow, um, I, I'm still your friend, Dennis. I don't know why these guys are so rude. Uh, it's very rude. What um, what do you guys think is the best? I mean, you talked about it a little bit maybe being action figures, but do you really do think that that's the best analog? Like, if you had to say this is the best analog to video games what would that be i i think toys because they're they're used in a similar fashion and they were made for the same audience not that comics weren't but comics you know comics are more akin to to you know books and coins than and toys are like made for kids to use for entertainment purposes you know imaginative play um like I saved when I was a kid, I saved the cards for all of my action figures and they, they my, made you want to save them. Stack of the Ninja Turtles. He's talking about like the actual clip cards, right? You're talking about clipping, clipping out of the back. Uh, I didn't clip the card off, but yeah, I kept the card back, right? Like you kept the card back cause it had like a cool story and like pictures of the other toys and stuff. Yeah. I kept How that. are you supposed to know Sergeant Slaughter's backstory? What the right. heck? You guys are crazy. No, like GI Joe had card files and stuff. Tyler, like, that was literally what the product was for. Yeah. <laughs> like I didn't save the plastic bubble I pulled off it. I just kept the card. Well, back. like the front's and all. That, to be clear, the front is all f-ed up because you took off the plastic bubble, and you're saving the thing for the the card back. The back. And yeah. both of you did this. This was like not because I had I, idea. Now, like I was saying, I clipped mine. So, so like there was a the little icon of the scissors and the dotted line for you to clip out specifically for Ninja Turtles. They had okay, the, the I didn't know this Joe. was a thing. GI Joe the, had it too. Yeah. So I, I, I clipped those out and kept those. But it sounds like Johnny kept the whole card back. Yeah, because I wasn't going to waste the time cutting stuff. <laughs> I could be doing other stuff. Who's got time stuff? for that? Who's got time for scissors? Yeah. Who's got time for scissors? I, I, man, I can't tell you the dread I felt every time in school, like in elementary school, when there was like a project and they like busted out the scissors because I was incredibly uncoordinated so like just look at scissors and i was just like i would see those like the lines we had to cut or whatever and just so much dread would come through me like there wasn't a day in school where they pulled out the scissors and like i knew we were gonna have to glue and cut stuff that i didn't feel like copious amounts of dread uh at being in that situation i was like please can we just do math or read i don't want to cut things so yeah no i was not cutting my card backs either I hated it. I, I still hate it to this day. I see those ugly like plastic scissors and I, I flash back and get all like, no. 
So that's just me. I ain't got time to cut shit. I just can't believe you guys saved any of this. If you if you handed me a sealed product, an action figure, or a video game, I would literally tear the packaging in half just to get at the meat of what I want to hold in my hand right now. Oh my god. Um. Well, you're a savage. Yeah. I, again, right. I just the the comic analogy doesn't work. Just uh, people are going to try to force it, and it's going to be funny. And just make sure to make fun of them in your head whenever well, you see it, uh, or tell them I, I to th- off like we just did. No, I look, I, I think with the comic thing, you're trying to identify a new medium. Like when you look at the storytelling medium and you try to identify key figures, like I think that's where the analogy comes in. Like, oh man, this is like Mario is an important figure now in the world. The way Superman is an important figure, Batman and Spider-Man. Like that's, that's where I can see the analogy being drawn. But I think like a one-to-one as a product analogy, it doesn't work. There. Well, so I also think talking. the people. I also think the people who regularly use that term know that they are baiting the audience that has come into this hobby, right? That's fair. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's like, hey, the comic people are the ones spending money now, so let's give them an analog that they love. Like that's a hundred, a hundred percent, in my opinion, how how that happened. Sure. And I'm specifically talking in in the condition, uh, you know, cartridge only, complete box, uh, because w- one day. WADA is going to release their their population report of sealed games, and there are going to be people who are like, oh my god, there's only, you know, 50 Super Mario Brothers of this specific variant in sealed condition. Uh, And sports cards, people do the same thing. They're like, wow, there's only, you know, 2,000 of these super desirable Jordans in PSA 10. Please ignore the other 14,000 of them on the census that have, like, a (laughs) ding on them. How about them? Uh, how, about them Char- how about them Charizards there, Tyler? Yeah, exactly. You know what? There's two thousand PSA Charizards. Please ignore the other tens of thousands of Charizards that exist in the world because Pokemon was the hottest thing ever. Next question: What makes something interesting versus not? And this comes from Tiger Wolf, and, and his uh, his example is is stadium events. Uh, for me, because I always say stadium events isn't interesting because th- there was this outside force that like people didn't care about stadium events it was just this is just business happening so i don't care that stadium events is like super rare it's not that it's like totally uncool but it's just never the value of the item does not match its interesting level right like it's not forty thousand dollars interesting it's not twenty thousand dollars it wasn't two thousand dollars interesting especially because it's a bad game i've always said that i want like, I want recognizable care. I want to care about the thing at least a little, you know? Like, stadium events is part of a set that I want, you know, so it gets some credence there. But, like, the story of stadium events, it, it's like a footnote to me. It, that doesn't make it interesting. So, um, I, I, I feel like, for me, uh, having, like, I want to care about a thing for it to be a little interesting. I want... Like, if there's a story, cool, like the Nintendo World Championships, I think that's like a cool story because kids went out and competed, but stadium events is just a business transaction, and that that is not interesting to me. That that would, that like... It's like exists. the Queen's we. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> just a transaction that happened for business people. It wasn't the, the thing that the kids who were playing the games, it wasn't part of my childhood or my nostalgia. So I, I think that, like, it, it has to have that link and stadium events link is it happens to be a Nintendo game and this thing happened where it got recalled or whatever the F happened, uh, whatever the truth is there. But that's not like, that's not very cool to me. Uh, and like, maybe if I was an adult, you know, and this happened, like now if a game got recalled for something, I'd be like, oh, well, that's interesting. What happened? And I'd be more interested in that story. But the part of me that's a kid that bred the nostalgia, that just, that doesn't, uh, you know trip any bells it's like why i look at the satchel games i'm like i don't even know what these are i don't care about these this is not a nintendo game to me this is just some garbage this could have come out at any time in any place i would not care about it so that's me you guys uh, what do you got i'm close to you in that i think that the more interesting stuff are going to be the ones that are tied to uh you know the franchises the games that actually matter and then i think there has there's like some level of rarity that makes things interesting because you know no matter how much you tell me Left Bros Super Mario Brothers 3? Like, okay, Left Bros is maybe 10 times rarer than Right Bros Super Mario Brothers 3. It's not the most interesting in the world because it's not, you know, incredibly rare. It's it's Super Mario Brothers 3. Uh, so you can see in what I've been purchasing, like that that Metal Gear Solid stockholder edition, uh, those are the kind of things I've been going after because I'm going after stuff that is a franchise I like or it's a video game I like. And I'm going after like the weirdest thing they've ever done with that thing or like some weird obscure variant uh, for that game. Uh, and then 
like conditional rarity that obviously matters in terms of what makes something interesting, but I don't think that's what we're talking about here. No, uh, I, I agree with you on the rarity part though. Like the part of like, you know, it's a carrot, right? That, that provides part of the chase. I like that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Dennis Khan guy who doesn't listen to the show, he says, uh, there's conditional Fox, rarity, the there's way. straight up rarity, there's relevance to collectors and there's relevance to the public. And those four things make a collectible. I mean, that's that's pretty bang on. The thing is, with uh, with straight rarity, there is so much that is super rare. Like, if you really get down into, like, weird variants, weird releases, stuff that barely exists, there is so much of it. And then there's just this small section of it that is in the collector's conscious. Stadium events. Stadium events. Not even close to the rarest uh, NES game. Uh, not even like, and you start seg- segmenting it. Like, well, it's the rarest uh, U.S. licensed retail release. Like, you could you could segment something down so it's the rarest thing, no matter what you do. But when you start thinking <laughs> of just like the straight up rarest Nintendo game, there are homebrews. There are one of. <laughs> there are prototypes. There are there are one known of. Uh, things like that. Uh, but they don't have the same collective conscious that Stadium Events has around it. So I think just having rarity. While it's interesting, if it's something you're into, it can't be the end all be all. Agree. So this is a interesting topic for me because I don't collect the same things that you guys do anymore. Which is uh, so um, for me, I think the thing that my, like the the lead horse for the things that I looked for is that for things that make things interesting um, is going to be. St- Story for me, like if something has a good story, I would not at three hundred thousand dollars, but I am definitely like the target market for the Queen's Wii, right? Like somebody Stephen's who's like looking... wondering, is he going to take five grand? Can I offer? Five grand? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I would. I would give five grand for that stupid thing. Um, I enjoy story. Let me give an example. So I uh, have a a a a rock. It's a piece of cement. It happens to be a piece of cement that is part of the original Nintendo building in Redmond when they bulldozed it in 2010. Uh, Reggie fils executive team signed two pieces of, this, of, of rubble, essentially, from the original building and auctioned it off internally uh, for Nintendo employees. I paid a fairly significant amount of money for a literal chunk of cement, but the story spoke to me so strongly being a piece of the original Nintendo campus that that's something that I absolutely had to have. Now, there are certain people who have looked at that and went, yeah, cool rock, bro. Uh, and there are other people who are like me and go, holy shit, that's really cool. So, but 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 those kinds of things are really what speak to me. You know, the my, my gameplay counselor binders are probably one of the most interesting pieces in my collection, in my opinion, because it's like a, a, an artifact that a gameplay counselor used every day to help kids through games. Like that, that, those kinds of things really, really speak to me. I, 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 I talk about pieces that I say radiate history, and those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about. When it's just like you, you, they have a presence to them. Those are the items that speak to me the most in currently, and that's and that's exactly why I sold off six thousand video games because those didn't really have that presence that spoke to me. They're mass produced, Stefan. Mass produced garbage actually oh is the way, it's the thing that I say that nobody likes me saying because Stefan doesn't love his childhood or the artifacts of it anymore. Yeah, and I generally he's a I hate everyone who collects them. Yeah, uh, he's, he's a monster. Stefan, don't, that rock is that. iconic. That is one of the most Stefan pieces in your collection. <laughs> the, the most Stefan thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I I do love that rock. Well, thank you. All right. Uh, that's it for the questions. So uh, thanks for those. And we will continue to kind of pepper these into the episodes. Uh, because, you know, I was thinking, and, and like Tyler brought it up, I was like, you're right, Tyler. Our episodes really don't go long enough. How could we <laughs> make know? them go longer? <laughs> Like every single time, guaranteed. I, I honestly now, decided this would be the the right episode to bring it up in because this episode can't be that long. We're just going over some price graphs. Yeah, we're not at two hundred. We're not at two hours and twenty minutes right now. Yeah. All right. So no, I I, I like having a couple of questions in, but like we may we like uh, time permitting is how we'll kind of answer how many questions we we get to so it might be one it might be two if we got a really short episode never happens uh but maybe it'll be four but uh no i I like answering questions in the show so that's cool but let's talk about uh the shortest part of the show now what did we buy and did we play anything and we'll go with uh, Stefan. you might as well just go ahead and tell us what 
shitty art you bought and like you know uh, put <laughs> put your monocle in have your top hat and get to business go ahead uh the two biggest things that i bought this this uh this cycle as it were star wars art in the context of Nintendo Power, is very, very rare. They, they, uh, even as rare as like Nintendo Power art is, which is the primary thing I collect, it's, it's very rare. They tended to use uh, photo stills from the film essentially to instead of instead of drawing anything for Star Wars. Um, one thing that they did do is during the Shadows of the Empire promotion when that game was coming out, is they did republish the Dark Horse. Uh, comic in, in segments. Um, and so I have been kind of quietly picking up a few pages. I'm actually still like in the midst of, of, of buying some interior pages, so I'm not going to uh, talk about that much. But one thing that I did close on that are uh, on their way from uh, from Australia right now is the, um, the cover paintings for Dark Horse Comics, Shadows of the Empire, issues uh, four and five, which are the, uh, the piece of Luke Skywalker striking down some red alien guys and a, uh, a beautiful picture of uh, Chewbacca and Leia. And those are, those are the two that are coming. Uh, the artist is Hugh Fleming. Um, he's an amazing painter. And those paintings are coming from Australia right now. And those are the... Uh those are the my 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 two big my two big things. Um, while I have the mic, Johnny, can I one more thing? Something that I saw today and it really bothered me, and I just wanted to take like thirty seconds to remind the take audience. Thirty seconds, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted everyone to know because I know a striking amount of people online, like seasoned collector, not even seasoned, but like the 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 new blood that is like spending significant amount of money. I just wanted to remind people or tell them for the first time, when you are buying VGA games, if you are buying something that says qualified on it, it is not sealed, okay? Not sealed, okay? Uh, so essentially, uh, this is, and I'm sure Tyler knows exactly what I'm talking about. In the in the high-end game rooms, the, there was a, a post about a Final Fantasy II qualified uh, 85 plus VGA that sold on eBay for six thousand three hundred dollars with fifty three bids. Um, it's clear to me, hopefully, that the buyer did not understand what qualified means. So I just wanted to take a second to, to just reiterate in case people, because I know we haven't talked Definitely, about it's VGA an auction. A ton. So at least two people didn't understand what they were buying a complete in box copy of Final Fantasy II for six thousand dollars. Exactly, and like even in that thread. There was people going like, oh, I'm really glad this thread existed because I had no idea. And these are like people who have bought like significant amounts of WADA games, right? People that I know have spent thousands of dollars who did not know that a qualified VGA game is not sealed. It is a CIB game. So I just wanted to like put that out there to maybe help some people who would otherwise spend thousands of dollars on a fucking open game that uh, that qualified in VGA standards is not sealed sealed that is my one more thing most of us aren't spending thousands of dollars on video games to begin with um individual video games collectively absolutely <laughs> but individual video games no it's crazy when uh when it's one game but when you break it up over 100 games like oh well, that six thousand dollars doesn't seem too bad but i do know we have a significant portion of audience at least or a a, a statistically relevant uh portion of our audience that does collect sealed so i just wanted to mention that Okay. Well, they don't collect sealed if they're buying VGA qualified. There was actually, <laughs> uh, I, I know we're getting off topic, but uh, did you see uh, when, when Jeff Master, I think in the high end game room, someone asked for a price check on a complete in box uh, Mike Tyson's punch out that he paid some uh, probably exorbitant price for. And like there was the realization he didn't realize that not every water game was sealed. So he had like this 9.4 oval seal Mike Tyson's punch out. And like it, Jeff had to tell him like, uh, you know, it's worth 500 bucks or something. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? I thought this is worth like 50 grand. <laughs> and it's like, mm. nope, that is, that's a complete in box video game you have there. See how it says CIB on the box? Oh. It was, a uh, that was like a couple months ago. Yeah. That was a while ago. It just reminds yeah, this me. Final you know, Fantasy was today, people. which is why I wanted to bring it up. Yes. All right. So moving on. Tyler. No, uh, I've got one more thing. Cause I said that I need to make Stefan look like a oh, fat Jesus. cat. Stefan, uh, you didn't miss out on an object you tried to purchase. Uh, and you tried to get in contact with the person who did buy that object. Uh, who was the buyer of the object you missed out on, Stefan? <laughs> uh, George Lucas. Oh. So, <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah. you're just competing with George Lucas for Star Wars memorabilia now. 
I did attempt to buy a painting, and the artist, I, the artist said it already sold, and I said, hey, can you put me in touch with that buyer because I'd really like to make them offer? And he said, the buyer is George Lucas, and the conversation ended very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what are you going to offer for that painting? You think he's going to uh, take it? <laughs> I'm not. I don't have his phone number. Um, not something that I was indeed provided. Was it a, it was a Star Wars piece? It was, yeah. It was a Shadows of the Empire cover, actually. It was a Shadows of the Empire number two. Interesting. That's, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what I would do if I was like a f-ing billionaire, but like collecting uh, original art from the thing I created. Yeah. Could you imagine you're like, yeah, I'll buy that art. I really love the art of my thing. Yeah. It's, it's really weird. Yeah. I'm sure like like all the no- most of the novel paintings, I assume, are at Skywalker Ranch somewhere, you know? Hmm. All right. Maybe he just likes to have all the original pieces for- Well, he's, he's also- He's also opening an art museum in Los Angeles in the next few years, so that might be a thing. Yeah. Oh, all the collectors say they're opening museums. Oh, I'm opening a video game museum. I, 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 think George, that yeah, I think George Lucas. I think George Lucas, <laughs> I think George Lucas <laughs> might, might be the guy. Street cred. <laughs> yeah. Uh, playing Tyler. anything, Stefan? Uh, nope. I mean, wow. But I, I'm, I'm always playing. Boring. Wow. Boring. Yep. Boring. Tyler, do it. What'd you buy? What'd you play? Uh, Johnny. I have been, all right, first, I played some championship pool. I have always, I played it on SNES. I think the NES version is very, uh, I don't need a survivor update. Survivor's been very boring. We're just voting random people off. Like, you don't even need to play the the games anymore. Like, it's obvious that, like, one of the two top guys is going to get immunity, and there's, like, ten of us left. So, like, half the people don't even play anymore, because there's no point in playing, because you're not going to get immunity anyway. I still play no Johnny. I'm, I'm here for the fun. Anyway, okay. one of the the one of our challenges was to play uh, a full tournament in championship pool on the Super Nintendo. And I've always known that for whatever reason, championship pool has been seen as like one of the hardest NES games to complete. And that's always like stuck out in my bed, like, head like that's really strange that a pool game that has uh, one of those. It has like the marker that shows you where your ball's going to go. How is that one of the hardest games to complete in championship pool? There are four qualifying rounds followed by a 32 man bracket tournament, uh, which it, it's five rounds until that gets to the, the world championships. And every single game is a best of seven uh, and you can't save. And if you lose a single match, you go back to the beginning. So assuming that you lose no matches, it takes between maybe seven and nine hours, no saves to play a full game of championship pool. Uh, I think it might be the longest game I've ever seen that doesn't have saves. And I've said that before about Blaster Master on this show. This game blows away Blaster Master. Just an interesting thing I thought I'd bring up. Okay. Other than that, Stardew Valley, I'm still having fun. Uh, I could tell it's going to be a job soon. And uh, one day we're just going to eventually burn out. So Ada actually is at the point where uh, she's thinking about stopping playing Animal Crossing. And... It's it's like a sad thing to watch. So she hasn't decided yet, but, you know, she's got like 1500 hours in this game and she's not going to reach like a satisfying conclusion. It's just going to be like, oh, I guess I don't have to log in and, and check on my my island anymore. And the same thing's going to happen with Stardew Valley. I'm not going to reach some satisfying end to Stardew Valley. It's just going to be like, oh, I don't feel like farming all day anymore. And it's just something about these modern games that just put you on these treadmills like they don't end when you're you're satisfied oh i beat it or oh i i got uh, i'm good enough at ninja gaiden that i don't have to play it every day for for three hours a day i don't know it's just kind of it's a little bit sad johnny what is sad uh what am i buying if if you are (laughs) sad that there's a place you can go tyler oh where you could go and find the pirates of dark water rules page on uh on Facebook, or you could go into the saddest channel uh, on the Patreon, on, on the Discord. Thank you, Johnny. I, I'll check that out. What am I buying, Johnny? I bought the Stardew Valley Collector's Edition. I bought it on Switch. Did we talk about this on the show? I think so. Okay. I, I don't know if we talked about it. I think we talked about it in the after show. We were looking at it. You were thinking about buying it. You, could, you were deciding on the Collector's Edition. I yeah, think. Like, I feel like over choice with these, like, collector's edition games like the over choice it it kills me because i'm playing on pc it's originally a pc game but i bought the switch version because it's like it says nintendo on it so i mean obviously that makes it better that's the only reason i bought nintendo it's not even the version i played it's not a version i would play 
but I bought it because it says Nintendo. If there was just a Nintendo Switch one, I'd be like, no problem. I'm just I'm buying that. I don't have to think about it. But it it reminded me limited run games, and I we keep bringing up limited run games. Man, they they're the best at making their own marketing here. Uh, they just had three NES chip tune albums for sale, Johnny. Did we talk about this? No, I mean we talked about it else. We okay. can talk about it on the show. So we go ahead. Yeah. So they had three chiptune albums for sale, NES chiptune albums. And that's already like on the edge of what I collect. I'm not really into chiptune albums, but eventually I'm like, ah, I'll just buy it, whatever. And to be clear, they're, they're Famicom ports. Like these, these albums are out there uh, on like play Asia and stuff. And they have the cheaper version comes in NES style boxes and they look great. Like they look like Nintendo games. And then they have the limited run game collector's edition boxes, which are in like the, the shitty boilerplate black limited run games boxes. The They want to make a collector's edition for a game, but they don't want to put any effort into it. So they're just like, ah, slap it in one of those black boxes, throw some pins or something in it and we're good. And I didn't know what to do. So I could get the better, what I thought was the better version for cheaper, or I could buy the one that's actually quote unquote collectible for more money, but I think they look worse. And I just bought neither of them because I'm like, I, I can't, there, I was a no win scenario. If only one of them was available, I would have just bought all three of them. But because they gave me too many choices and both of them had pros and cons, I didn't want to decide between them. I don't like the over choice in this market, Johnny. I understand. I, I get paralyzed with that uh, myself, that Castlevania release. Like, I wonder what people are going to choose on that. Obviously they're going to choose the ultimate edition because they called it the ultimate edition, but you know, so, the good part with the Castlevania is that the every step up you go, it, it just includes everything from the previous tier. It's not yes. like you're choosing between one or the other. Like a Kickstarter. Yeah, it's just like they, they build a bigger <laughs> box around the thing. Like you could buy the game or you could buy a game with a, a medium sized box around it. Or you could buy the big box that has the medium sized box in it. Um, yeah. But even then, like, I don't know, like looking at modern games, like, do I buy the collector's edition? Do I buy the standard edition? Do I care? Do I just not buy this? I don't know. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, anyway, what, say. I, I bought uh, a bunch of games from Jeff the Game Boy Ferris, which you think I talked about, but I didn't. I bought Harvest Moon on Game Boy, Donkey Kong Land 1 through 3, and Sonic Advance 1 through 3, which uh, he is cashing out some video games to buy Power 9 Unlimited. So good luck with that, Jeff. I think you might already have most of that. And, uh, oh, man, man, I got so much good stuff. Johnny, I got a UPC Sonic from Video Game Sage. I got it from Dyer, who is from the UK, I believe. He bought a lot in the UK of American Sega Master System games. And so from Europe, I got a UPC Sonic. And uh, Makes total sense. Yeah. That, you know like, how I feel about the UPCs. I know you it's hate the, the UPCs thing. and they don't count. Um, it's the only thing that counts. Who gives <laughs> um, a shit? Uh, the game well, is the thing, remember, Tyler? Uh, what? Hold on. All right, let's 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 uh let's talk about this for a second. What game is the thing, Jimmy? No. <laughs> no, game thing. game. Sonic is the thing, right? The the game in the box is the thing. This is just like a a port sticker. Like who gives a shit? This like slapped on so people know how to purchase it in the U.S. This is what uh, we care about. Yeah, but without that sticker, Johnny, it could have been sold in Europe, and only the most disgusting of games are sold in Europe. Okay. <laughs> And uh, the right, best cool. thing I got was from Red the Game Shark. I got a V Jump Chrono Trigger. Uh, there was a contest in V Jump, which is a manga magazine a or magazine. A pop culture magazine. <laughs> but basically, they gave away uh, 2,000 copies of Chrono Trigger and they came in like a special copper colored box. Uh, so it's a, it's a shiny, rare version of Chrono Trigger. This is for the super fan, is, to be clear. Is the, is the contents of said box any different than retail? Uh, no, I think it's just the box and it comes with a, uh, like a, there's an insert that's different. Got it. Cool. Uh, so the, the, so there's a Chrono Trigger sample ROM and it comes with like a little coming soon pamphlet. Uh, and the, this version of Chrono Trigger comes with that pamphlet. So, uh, pro probably just Neat. like, it's an early release of Chrono Trigger that was given away in a contest. It's probably similar to Chiromera Zelda, except nowhere near as rare. Uh, these are out there. But yeah, they're cool. Red found me one after many months of me bugging him about it. Awesome. Good find. Yeah. Nice. All right. Anything else you buy you want to talk about? No, that's it. What'd that's you get, John? Okay. Um, all right. Well, 
let's see. I bought, you know, I'll tell you what we bought. My my wife is is mad right now, and I don't mean mad like angry, like just like madness. She's overcome with Harry Potter books right now. So a lot of money went to Harry Potter books. So not a lot of money went to games because literally too much money was going to Harry Potter books for me to also be buying crazy amounts of games. Um, I did get like, and you guys are going to be, this is going to be a real shocker, but I, I got two Japanese Harry Potter games. Whoa. Hey, uh, whoa. I know we're all the about the inter- Japanese games in the collector's quest podcast. Yeah. This like, man, this, I know this isn't exciting, but, um, Chamber of Secrets and Prisoner of Azkaban on the Game Boy and PlayStation in Japan, and I think the Xbox too. So, in Japan, they got different covers for Game 2 and Game 3. So, that's interesting. So, this is the only place you can get those covers, so those were interesting. So, I got them. I got I got the two covers that you don't normally see. Um, what else did I buy? I also got games from Jeff. Uh, I think I mentioned that on the last show, though. And, uh, yeah, that's what I got, except my LCD came. My uh, Splatterhouse LCD, which will be a Halloween thing that I'll show off at at one point in time, that came from Australia. It was beautifully packaged. I am so happy it arrived safely. I was so worried because, you know, it's an old, flimsy-ass box. You just think traveling, like, it's harder to get farther away from me than Australia. Yeah. So... I, you know, I did mention just, my two paintings are coming from there, too, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, you're just I'm, like... I am blinded with terror, just in yeah, case anyone like, was interested. Yeah, you're like, I just hope this is okay. Um, so, yeah, those came, and then... So, this is stuff that I'll be saving for my Halloween stuff. But uh, another game, and this I love to call it this, but uh, Haunted House Black Box for the Atari came in. So, I got that. I, I like and calling that's, it... That's part of the uh, Black Box NES set, right? Does, do people call it that? No, I I did this because specifically it annoys you. Oh my god. <laughs> Which is, is the best reason to do anything. Yeah. And there's also haunted house in a black box. So um yeah, I got that for Atari and it came in like pretty good shape for an Atari game. I I was very pleased to see it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's uh, a Sears box. Uh, it says Sears Tele-games. up in the upper left hand. The garbage Sears version Tele-games, of Atari games. Except it comes in a sweet black box. So rather than diminish it the way Tyler, you, you guys have noticed that tower is a bit of a diminisher right 100%. so what? this is how i this is how i elevate things i looked at this <laughs> and i said what are this what is this game's best quality besides being haunted house and being attached attached to a very early gaming memory for me and also being associated with halloween well let's associate it with something else that's good black box games on the nintendo so this is uh, part of the black box atari collection go <laughs> make sure you get yours the tele games uh, are rarer than the, the regular atari version they so absolutely are let me uh let me pump it up yeah, yeah. way rarer so, uh, not the version uh, of Haunted House on the Atari NFT, though. So uh, probably has limited uh, public knowledge <laughs> compared to the regular Haunted House. You know. True, true. Um, yeah, and you, you'll notice it's different. Like, even the cart says that it's a, a telegame. Like, it says Sears on it and stuff. So uh, you'll see all that stuff. But the most important thing to see, and that's and the distinction Tyler fails to notice, is the black box. Tyler, it's a black oh. box Atari game. Oh, it's a black box. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty nice then. I mean, you 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 like might be like, oh, that's like a point of distinction, but that is literally how the most collectible part of Nintendo games are just <laughs> are distinguished. What? Oh, those are the black box games. I like, don't mean to used... be a diminisher here, but when I think of Atari games, I think of the line of Atari games that all look the same, similar to the black box games, which would be the standard released Atari games. I mean, or you could buy the sweet rare versions, which are like haunted house, right? Like, and wait, black Johnny, box. Johnny, I could settle this debate. There's one correct thing to do. It's not buy Atari games. That, that is also true. I, uh, and the only reason I'm even doing this or schlepping for Atari right now is, uh, Halloween stuff, you know, I, I, <laughs> I was just like, you know, I like when I was doing Halloween stuff and like when I first like got into this as an idea back when I was writing the dumbass blog, I say dumb, like I shouldn't diminish my own thing. It, it was a fine blog for the time, but just the idea of writing blogs today sounds very silly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it should have been a video blog. Um, I, I went out and like when the, when I was doing the Halloween one, I was like, man, 
Haunted House was the first thing I thought of. Not a Nintendo game, it was Haunted House uh, when I thought of video games in Halloween. So I thought, why shouldn't I, uh, if you know the Lord of the Rings meme, why shouldn't I buy Atari Black Box games like Haunted House? Stop so saying that's Black it. Box. <laughs> I'm gonna, if I keep saying the Black Box game, <laughs> I think it'll stick. I think people want to be with me on this. The thing is, Heritage Auctions, they describe Atari games by their box color because uh, I honestly don't know that much about like super deep Atari variants, but there are some variants like Pitfall has a dark green release and a light green release. So they had to distinguish those. But then for whatever reason, they just started doing it on every single box. So they'll call like Haunted House Burgundy box is the original release when it's just like it's just Haunted House. It doesn't matter. It's the box color box. has nothing not to do Burgundy. with it. So they'll probably would call Telegames things Haunted House Black Box. And that's part of the reason it's driving me crazy. Glad to help. <sighs> Anyways, so yeah, I, I I got those. So that's like a preview of some of the... Halloween stuff. I, I have like this big scheme of things I'm going to do this Halloween. We'll see if I have the time to do that, which is like unlikely, but maybe, maybe if I get my shit together, I'll, uh, I'll have enough time to, to make all the Halloween things work. Um, anything else I bought, I, I showed on my Instagram. I've got some exciting Harry Potter stuff coming and a couple more. Did I talk about all the PAL games? I've got a bunch of PAL Super Nintendo games that finally arrived. Oh, I think that's what I was waiting on. Uh, yeah, last episode, I had all that stuff from my freight forwarder coming, and it, it wasn't here yet. So all of my PAL Super Nintendo games arrived, um, and I didn't consolidate it right, Tyler. By that, I mean I didn't consolidate it at all. So what wound up on my door was 17 packages from DHL. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds expensive, and but I don't know enough about shipping. It, it wasn't. It was a $100 shipping total. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, so and I bought and some of those things were books. Some of those were Harry Potter books, like heavy, heavy items coming DHL. So it would have been like three hundred dollars shipping from the UK had I had I tried to have them all individually shipped, and they wouldn't have been shipped DHL. Like when we were talking about it on the last episode, so they left, they left uh, Europe on Monday. Like they left the UK on Monday, or. No, Wednesday. They left on Wednesday and they arrived at my door on a Friday. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Don't know how to do it. Yeah, it was was insane. Like, I don't get stuff from from Nevada or even <laughs> in California that fast. The fact that it just came and it was like, boop, here it is. I mean, that can't be typical. It, it was magical, though. Especially it's because we spent ridiculous that, amounts on shipping. Like, I spent $200 uh, to ship a box from Japan. It's like, wow, it, they put it on a plane for $200 and it showed up two days later. Amazing. I, I know, but like, had I, had I, I could have spent $300 and everything would have been on a boat coming, you you know, crushed in, and in like a month, you know, I would have got it for more money is what I'm saying. So if you're not using a freight forwarder yet, or if you're interested in pal stuff, you should really look into a freight forwarder. Uh, it is worth it. They're like, it's not like you're like, oh, well, if you spend the extra money, it's worth it. You're probably going to save money and it's worth it. Like that's, it's harder it's harder to get better than that. Also, with a, like a freight forwarder, you get a bunch of packages. You have like thirty days. So, like when you plan when you're planning on buying your pal stuff or whatever, you get like thirty days. Uh, it's a little less good since um, not everything is cheaper to the UK now that the whole uh, Brexit thing is like happening, and the European Union is like not like super friendly on post to the UK as far as pricing goes anymore. So, if you are specifically buying in the UK you can get a very good price. And I was buying Harry Potter stuff, so that was, like, pretty easy to do. Because it's, uh, you know, the land of Harry Potter. Anyways. And if you're looking to fill um, up your packages, you could just buy uh, 200 ZX Spectrum games. <laughs> yes, you could. Like, uh, they will also do a thing where they can, for a little more money, they'll consolidate and put it in, like, one box, uh, which would be safer and better to do, I think, long run. But I didn't do that, so, yeah, I got all these packages. But, yeah, I got a ton of, uh, of box Super Nintendo games, which is awesome. Who doesn't love boxed Super Nintendo games? So, yeah. And there, there's some good ones in there, too, like Salveon and stuff. So th there's there's good games in there. I'm very excited. I have to show some pictures of those. Um, yeah, that's it. That's what I bought. Hey, Tyler, I played something. What? Stefan, I played video games. Call what? of Duty? No, not Call of Duty. What? I played Uncharted. Oh, yeah, nice. The first one? Yeah. The first one and the second one and part of the third one. 
Wow. Yeah. Well, as like because a, tr- as a collection or yeah, I'm playing on the PS4, the okay. the Uncharted collection, okay. um, which I hadn't done. I bought it and I like started the first one and didn't go very far. And so I was like, oh, you know, my son is here and sometimes he will let me play a video game and like be vaguely interested. But I played Uncharted and he was interested for like three hours. He just wanted to, I mean, he was also pretty tired that day. <laughs> so he just wanted to rest on the couch. Uh, he's two. So it, that's very uncommon. He's normally like in and out of every door and trying to climb the stair. He's, he's a terror. Uh, it, he's never sit still. It's incredible that he sat still this long, but he was like, yeah, he held the other controller and like, was like interested in watching me, the mechanics of me playing with the controller and then like the guy moving on the screen. So he let me do that. So I got through a bunch of uncharted and then Mike and my wife was kind of into it. And so instead of like watching a show, she's like, you can play your game or whatever. We'll just sit here and watch you because uncharted is basically playing a movie. And, uh, yeah, I did that all the way through the first and second game and, uh, into the third my son is now more restless. He does, he wants the controller himself. He also understands which controller is actually controlling the oh, the game. No. So he's not. Yeah, you can't just you hand can't him be any the random brother controller. anymore. No, he like and he's two. So I'm glad that this trick has already failed. You know, it's very sad. He's like no, and like he points to mine and he like tries to trade me. And I'm like no, dude, that's not <laughs> that's not what's happening. So and then like sometimes he finds the other PlayStation for a controller and then it'll like turn it on and then that interacts with the screen it messes everything <laughs> up so i don't know how much more video gaming i have in my future uh for the next month or so because he is uh he's not about that bullshit other controller life anymore bummer he wants to play himself so that's it that's what i played that's what i bought we did the thing all right guys where can we find you johnny i've got some errata that i don't want to remember to put later on uh, okay go uh what was it though i'm just kidding johnny uh we gave some somewhat rightfully so to guitar hero people were paying like a thousand dollars for upc guitar hero and i said that (laughs) it originally came in a big box so the not for the part of a set guitar hero is the real first print i'm 100 percent incorrect the upc guitar hero is what came uh, in the controller bundle for Guitar Hero originally. But they, so these people are cracking Guitar Heroes to yes. get the UPC? So that's the part that's, that's stupid. Bullshit. They're cracking open the big box and just grading a game inside of it, which is dumb. So they're rooting, so it's not even the complete artifact anymore. It's just bullshit. Yes. I mean, that's like the people who are grading the, I'm one of them, uh, graded a seal, the, the sealed challenge set Mario's, the Mario 3's. That happens a lot. Yeah, but that, like, you can get, like, but this is the the thing, like, uh, that I'm not feels for different, this. Stefan, because you don't need, I mean, you need the NES to play Mario 3. Stop making examples, Stefan. We're here to do <laughs> something yeah, on like, the, the diminisher. Guitar hero, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the Guitar Hero is the box, you know, it, it, the box and the guitar are the thing. It's called Guitar Hero. It's the first presence of it. Anyway, you know, it, it you, you would think it, the most collectible version would be the original Guitar Hero box with the guitar, and you'd be like, okay, here's the cool thing. They're like, no, forget that. Here's one that we can just grade because it's got a UPC. We're getting it mint condition. Just yeah, that doesn't fit into a lot of like You can't the- put the big box in a lot of case. Uh, same thing with Zelda. Uh, was it Four Swords Adventures on the GameCube? Yeah. Uh, oh, my outer box is in bad condition. Doesn't matter. I'm going to throw it out <laughs> and get the oh, inside. Oh, that's cool. Grid. That the uh, oh man, fuck that outer box. You got a sweet sealed copy inside. Man, it's not a fortune cookie, guys. Don't f-ing break it open and get to the center. It's like. It's not a Tootsie Pop. It's not a fortune cookie. It's none of these things. The whole thing is the important thing. Stop it. Anyway, oh, I did different. want to make that correction. The The part of a set one came in a later. There was a, a three pack of Guitar Hero games. There's so many of those three packs on PS2. It was one of those three packs uh, that came with three Guitar Hero games. I think it was like one, two and Aerosmith. Anyway, I like being correct. Did not want that to be out there. And now we can talk about where we, we can find Johnny underscore Ayuchi. Yep. At Instagram. Oh, on Instagram. Okay. That's not. Yep. And Tyler. So, well, I'm uh, I'm default gen, default gen, video game sage, YouTube, Instagram. Send me a message on Instagram. Okay, and Stefan. Uh, I am regularly found on Twitter and sometimes YouTube. Uh, Art of Nintendo Power or at Art of NP. Um, the S- the SEO is very good, so just search for Art of Nintendo Power. You'll find me. It's good. Thanks. Yep. 
All right, and uh, if you want to join us on Patreon, remember, that's patreon.com slash collector's quest. Thanks so much for listening. We're out of here. Bye. That's our show. Thank you to the patrons. And okay, special update here. Will Joe. I, I have to do like all this nickname stuff manually. Every week I have to check for new patrons and give them all nicknames and then make sure that everything matches up correctly. I'm just saying Patreon doesn't facilitate this at all. Will Joe. You are actually our biggest patron. You have pledged above our highest tier. And the way Patreon shows that is it shows you not in a tier. So I actually thought that at some point you canceled your Patreon when you are actually our f***ing biggest patron. And I, I stopped shouting you out at the end of the show and you just said nothing. You never reached out to me or anything like what the f***. So Will Joe, the Millennium Will Joe special you get to be above richard patron number one this week and uh, i'm sorry if you have felt left out of uh this nicknaming the rest of the patrons richard patron number one bowden high-end collector andrew brim 50 hertz is good enough for me andre what a 9.8 a plus plus benji brian gupta and pocky and rocky with becky mint condition brian j mora sophisticated investor cart mcgeddon canadian variant alert chris glidden Fat Cat Collector, Chris Jackson, Chris SNK, Too Many NES Accessories, Morozek, Johnny's GBA Hookup, Coffee with Mr. Saturn, The Last Game You Need for the Set, Corey O'Brien, Unpunched Hang Tab, Dustin Beagle, Man of Nintendo in the World of Nintendo, Funky Brewsta, The Actual Shinobi, Just Sonic the Kid, Jeff the Game Boy Ferris, Lance Lord Hardstyle Z, otherwise known as Lance, The Degenerate Matt Fall, Funko Land, employee, platform agnostic, read the game shark. The Famicom Box Retro Game Enthusiast, Sean the Gamer Collective, previously unknown variant, Tim Walker, can't put limits on collecting, VG Collectaholic, the official seal of quality, Andy Gilzeichter. Andy, I feel like I gave you a name before, but I didn't have a name for you when I was going through the list, so if I forgot to shout you out the past episode, or if I gave you a worse nickname this time, I'm sorry, I wrote down the name this time. <laughs> Keeper of Zelda Variants, Zero X Death Code, the actually rare Bird Dog Gaming, Brandon Rogers, whose favorite episode is the wrestling episode, still finding deals in 2021 somehow, Colton Murphy, Derek Lauer, who made me edit this show, Jeremy Jarvis, here for the Pog Talk, Jim Jacobs, world record holder of best collection, Video game art collector because games are art. Justin Chichio, lateral movement. Who's got a Donkey Kong kill screen coming up? If anyone wants to see a Donkey Kong kill screen, <laughs> getting pretty long with the nicknames here. Michael posted in the Discord right now. Chiara Monty, Nick, the video game database. Morgan, the other guy who collects Korean releases. Peaceful Games, the promoter. Retro RPG podcast. Tex, who collects for Jaguar. Tom Obscure Variant Chaser Chase, getting the full PS2 set because Stefan won't, all caps. Andrew actually collecting for N-Gage O, B-Nugs, B-Nugs. Corhagen does what Nintendo don't. Daniel McArdle, who thought this was the Retronauts Patreon. The Xbox Authority, Danny Gomez, the Philatelist Dork Overlord, my childhood PlayStation idol, Game-Rave.com, Joe actually plays his games champ pity, homebrew mastermind, Nick Ryan, and Sean the video game Illuminati LaCroix. Thank you guys so much.